Yo, this is Alex Mouth with Destiny, and today I'm bringing you an exclusive interview with Bald Omni Man, also known as Coach Paris Butler. He's a very strong, real natural, with a solid understanding of programming while also having an aesthetic physique. I really respect him as a person and lifter, and I've personally learned a lot from his videos and comments over the years. In fact, he even accurately predicted my Wonder Max bench and pull up PRs. So I highly recommend you all subscribe to him this moment if you want excellent advice and no BS content. Paris, welcome to the channel. Appreciate you, bro. I appreciate the uh, the accolades. Like I said, I don't want to pat myself on the back too much. I really just try to put myself out there and give people the tools to be able to get strong like me. Because I'm going to be honest with you, man, and we'll talk about this more, I guess, at length later, but there, there is no natural limit. Like, let's just cut to the chase. That's what I believe. Yeah. Oh, all kinds of memes I've made about it, whatever, but that's what I genuinely believe. And I believe most people aren't limited necessarily by their genetics more so than like their knowledge and their willingness to be able to learn certain things. So y'all can all get strong just like me or Alex. It's not exclusive to anybody, really. Unless like you have legs that don't work, an arm that doesn't work, or something that prevents you from being able to eat food or digest nutrients, like you can get strong. Get stronger than you think. See, I was going to ask you a generic question. Who is Paris Butler and why do you start making videos? But let's just kick it off with the natural limit, right? I've also come to the realization that doesn't exist. And that sounds very bold for people who don't really watch some of the underground natty channels. But once you really dive into it and you think about it logically, right? Everyone talks about how at some point you stop making gains, but no one can quantify what that is. Like in the past, I would always say, if you're still adding five pounds a year to your bench, you might as well call it a limit. But really, is it? No. And the more you learn about programming, the more your program changes as a whole. And that affects the rate of progression. So what people deem to be a plateau is nothing more than slow progression, but it's still happening. And uh, I want to know your take on strength standards, because you seem to have very high expectations for naturals. And what is the viewpoint on the average lifter watching this field right now? Just how far could they take the performance on, say, the big three? Or even diving into weighted pull-ups, overhead press, all the other stuff that isn't powerlifting related? That's an excellent question, bro. So I just want to qualify this by saying it somewhat is leverage dependent, but I'll just use myself, for example. I have longer arms relative to, like, my limb length as far as my legs and my torso, my bench range of motion is twice what a lot of people who I see throw up comparable numbers are. And yet, I lift the same, if not more than that, on the bench press. So I say all that to say this. If you have shorter arms and you're someone that, you know, thinks that a 315 bench press is like a lifetime goal for you, it's not the case at all. At least a 405 bench. At least a 405 bench. And within five years, seven years, if your programming is optimized, but there's a there's a, a way that you need to qualify that. I've been training for a long time. A very small portion of my training history was completely dialed in to the point where, following that thread of progression, I'd be able to force and press 375, bench 405, do all these things that I can do. And then within that span, it was maybe like four, four or five years, maybe, that I made most of my gains. A lot of it was just like trying to be lean, long distance running, mm -hmm. counts, like all this shit that had nothing to do with getting strong optimally. A lot of people don't do that. And to that point, a lot of the people that say that there is a natural limit, I look at their training and I, I'm like, I can tell why you think that. <laughs> train like garbage to be honest with you yeah so that's something that i always look at when people tell me that they have some sort of preconceived notion of their strength standards that it's super low i'm like okay let me see your training okay i can tell why you think a 225 outside of your grasp because you're not training. right so basically the training history is a great indicator not all years are created equally you could you could have been working out from 20 to 30 years old but if six of those years was absolute garbage, then you haven't gained your so-called 90% of size and strength yet. You're nowhere close. And so 
I think a lot of us don't look at our years objectively and the rate of progression by having workout logs and stuff like that. Oftentimes the PRs don't really change that much and we don't push ourselves or try to really correct the root cause behind our plateaus. And just to use myself as an example, I created my own self-imposed limitations in the lower body. It has nothing to do with genetics. There are people with you know, worse leverages than me that surpass me. And that started around 2018 till now. So you can say that's four years of training, but was it? No, it's just four years of dabbling around. And that's what a lot of people seem to do. And then they'll assume that that plateau is in fact a limit, but really that was never the case. And it seems that you're describing that as well in the sense that it's really the last four years where you saw explosive growth. And technically it should have been less progress because you have more training experience, but it's the opposite because you now understand what a good program entails. Exactly. Not only just gaining experience in terms of knowledge, training people, things like that, but also just practicing what I preach, you know, applying these things to myself and just bulking, not trying to be in a oh, better yeah. We'll talk about that later. Like, we'll talk because I'm good at being lean. And yeah. We're gonna, I'm going to talk to everybody watching about why, even if you're someone that can be lean, it still behooves you to bulk. Here's the, like the training piece. I can even say, bro, like, to be quite honest with you, I know I said four years, about half of that, probably starting around when, you know, global events happened and everyone. Okay. Was that was like the most super dialed in. I'm bulking hard. I'm training hard. I'm training smart. I went from at the beginning of, uh, you know, that saga where everybody got locked down. I know you can't say it on YouTube. I started with a, uh, like a 320, like, heave ho sinking your chest bench press like feet on the ground using leg drive not a real pause anything to the numbers that i'm lifting now on my channel within that two-year time frame so and what's your current one or max bench or estimation somewhere above 405 i never got to test it just because I, I tweaked it a little my, my pack a little while ago it's good now but i was aiming for 425 my best lifts that i posted on youtube are in terms of the bench press it's like a 370 or 375 Larson press. I did 385 as well, but it was bouncy, so I didn't post it. So extrapolating that over, I knew I was ready to hit over 405, but I didn't want to necessarily go into that peak because, like I said, my goal was 425. Exactly, yeah. So about 80 pounds increased on my bench press in two years, I guess. That's explosive growth. And many would say that's not even possible. You must be a fake natty in disguise. Yeah, people accuse me of taking steroids all the time. It's like, no, dude, I just trained and I bulked. Like, to be honest with you, I'm someone that always stayed lean, but I let myself get very heavy, up to 200. Mm -hmm. I weigh like a buck 70 now. I was 210 pounds at the peak of my bulk. So. Well, it seems to be a common problem that guys are trying to stay excessively lean year round and they don't really go anywhere. But then they start a bulk and all of a sudden, all these problems magically go away. And with the bench press, it especially seems to be weight gain dependent. In my case, when I got to 405, I was 186 pounds, you know? Uh, I didn't try to maintain the leanest physique. I had some fluff. And sometimes that's just what you gotta do. Take your gains to the next level. And then when you cut, Okay, you'll lose some of that performance, but your base point is still going to be higher than before you did it. And still much faster progress overall when you balance out the time frame. Absolutely. So being that, because we'll talk the aesthetics piece for a little bit, because that's what most people are just gonna, invariably going to be worried about. They want to look like they lift as well as being strong. But they have this perception of, okay, I bolt. Now I'm scared to cut because I'm going to lose everything. I'm always someone that says anything that you lose in terms of performance you can get gained back very quickly. You're not going to lose really any muscle. And if you do, that comes back very quickly as soon as you start to introduce calorie maintenance and then a calorie surplus. 
So if you lose over the course of you cutting, for example, let's just say you bulk for a year and a half, you cut for four, five, six months mm -hmm. through some galaxy brain laser eyes apparatus, you determine that, okay, I lost, I lost three pounds of muscle. Okay. You enter a calorie surplus for two months. You gain all that back very quickly, and then you quickly surpass that top end strength that you had when you were bulking. And now and you're at a leaner body weight. weight. Yeah. At a lighter body weight, exactly. Exactly. That's something that young men especially need to hear just from people like you or I, like, dude, like, okay, you may lose a little bit, you'll gain it back very quickly. And what you'll find too is when you get back to a somewhat lean state, you're a bit heavier because you actually put on muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you're going to, if you cut from 200 to 170, maybe that 170 looks like your previous 167, just to say. Mm -hmm. And that adds up year after year. So in your case, from 2020 till now, you probably put on at least five pounds of muscle. Absolutely. Yeah, I think, and like you can never exactly know what your body fat percentage is. You can only go based yeah. on, okay, this is how my face looks. I have veins in my legs and shit and my hips everybody's and, different you know so you're you're about nine ten percent body fat when you're like that um i'm about even compared to 2020 to 2021 my like 10 ish percent body fat range was like 165 and then at the end of this bulk and cut cycle it was 169 like, like you said about four or five pounds of muscle that's a lot like you you compound that over even five years let's say you put on five and then three and a half and then two and then another two that's what I'm, I'm terrible at math but i think that's like 10 pounds you're gonna look totally different yeah well that's uh with naturals right you won't see a big physical difference year to year assuming the body fat is similar but it's after a few years that passed by different sagas per se that's when you can see, wow, this guy actually made gains. So maybe between 2015 and 2017, okay, you look somewhat similar, maybe a little bit better, but the 2017 physique versus 2021 is night and day different because you actually put on a certain level of muscle that was tiny, but that accumulation gives you that ultimate look. Absolutely, and it really is those that small accumulation of marginal gains over time that really just contributes to something so much bigger than like if you were to just say stopped like after you hit intermediate status for example you stop you're pretty strong it's getting harder to get stronger you're like i'm at my natural limit mm -hmm. Whereas you just kept training and kept trying to learn from people that know more than you trying things trial and error you give yourself four or five more years your 315 bench goes to 405 you deadlift over 600 pounds if that's what you want to do. You get extremely strong at whatever lift you're trying to train, and you put on a lot of muscle. Right, because you're going to have people who come in and say, I have horrible genetics. You don't know what you're talking about. There's no way for me to make progress. For those people who have really bad leverages, I know you referenced yourself on the bench, how you still got to basically four plates with that deep range of motion. Um, what is your advice? in them settling for say intermediate status what programming tidbits could you give to finally make them realize that hey bro stop making excuses it's, and, and it's not your genetics that's the problem you just got to learn more as you said before absolutely so that's that's a big premise of my channel actually so i always like to qualify the things that i say as to say who they will apply to you know there's best practices but then there are things that really just apply to certain people what we're talking about here is kind of that limb dominance versus torso dominance thing. And I like on my channel to put specificity to that. So for that person that, say, for example, has bad levers on their bench press, they have long arms, they're really narrow, whatever. First of all, you have to look to see if that's actually the case. It's a really easy litmus test if you record yourself benching. So if you're recording and your camera's in front of where your feet at, that better make sense to people watching. But you want to be able to see where the plane of your arm is in relation to the plane of the bench. If it's below, parallel with the bench, okay, yeah, you have longer arms and your leverages are not the best. But if they're parallel or above parallel, you have good leverages for bench press and you need to look at something else. 
just wanted to qualify that because there's people that think they have bad leverages that they, they don't. But if you do have longer arms, you want to pick not only main movements, but accessory movements that address that. So with long arm bench pressers, regular bench press is going to be very fatiguing for you versus someone that has shorter arms just because you're going through way longer of a range of motion. It's basically like if you were benching, like if someone with shorter arms was benching primarily with a camera bar, like that was just their default. Data right. Anyway, so that being said, stuff like floor press for a lot of volume, since it's a partial range of motion when really it's just parallel, you can fill that in for a lot of volume. You may actually find that if your arms are really long, they go through a full range of motion when you do a bench press. So any extra tricep work in that case, and that's not all the time, uh, but any extra tricep work in that case could just lead to overuse and beat your elbows. Mm. When you say that many times, this topic of torso versus arm dominance has to do with exactly what you just described. It's the range of motion itself. So in my case, I have shorter arms, uh, mm -hmm. pretty good leverages on the bench, and my triceps never responded that well to it until I started really increasing the range of motion and exaggerating the end phase of the lift with uh, accommodating resistance and doing a lot of direct tricep work. I found that if I don't do that, the weights just feel heavy in my hands and I have trouble locking weights out, not because I lack explosiveness. Like I can literally dead bench crazy amounts, but I'm talking actual lockout issues because of the tries. Everyone that talks about, you know, quote unquote, not being able to put poundages on their bench press or to get a bigger chest it's always people that have longer arms that are just following programs that are well written just in general but they don't understand that they need to adjust certain things as per their individual leverage so to your point i remember when you dead bench a whole bunch and thinking the same thing like it's not his off the chest that's an issue it's his triceps and then you started working your triceps and your bench went up. um i think people with Better leverages need to understand that um, tricep work is very important for them specifically for that very reason. So if you're someone that is good at bench press, don't just bank on the fact that, okay, I have good leverages on bench press and I'm just going to be able to uh, unga bunga spam this <laughs> lift. Yeah. You're going to need to do accessories that cater to your weakness, which is your arms, your triceps. Right. And what I like is that you pointed out there's range of motion of the exercise and then there's range of motion as it pertains to your anthropometry. And I think it's really cool that you're defining it by the arm angle and how you can still get pretty much the same training effect, whether you're disadvantaged or not. So if I'm doing a floor press, uh, everybody's at 90 degrees in that case. But that's relevant as an accessory, depending what our comp bench looks like. And um, one thing I want to ask you about is because you kind of alluded to this a little bit the importance of brute strength not just technique work and, and trying to use the best form possible to lift the most amount of weight like what is the importance of hypertrophy training and difficult variations to make your standard stuff easier that's an excellent question so that's actually what my training system is partially based around um, is using those variations that are harder than your main lift and adjunct like in addition to the main variation or some you know close deviation of it so for example larson press let's use that for example you use that which is a bench press in absence of leg drive and we'll talk about larson press a little bit specifically later but you use that in absence of leg drive to make your feet on the ground bench press feel like steroids basically so like I like to say for Larson press, it turns uh, a single into a triple or a double, essentially. Okay. Or it had like four or five extra reps. And if you put, so let's say you start with uh, 350 bench press and a 315 Larson press, and you go to uh, 340 Larson press, your brute strength increased dramatically. It's going to be that much proportionately higher when you go to a bench press, when you start introducing the technique of leg drive and whatever else that goes into your competition setup, it may be a little bit bigger of an arch. 
you don't necessarily want to focus too much on the technique work. You only need a little bit to maintain your proficiency with arching leg right. traps. You want to spend the majority of your time getting more jacked and just getting stronger. It's the difference between demonstrating strength and building strength. That's why I swat with the safety bar. I can swat more with the barbell, but I'm not trying to demonstrate my strength right now. I'm building. And that's what my training is about specifically right now. Building strength, building muscle. Exactly. And I think the difference, too, is that you're not a competitive powerlifter. You're, you want general strength. So when talking about things like the overhead press, uh, that's still relevant to your goals. And it's going to have carry over to other movements that aren't necessarily competition lifts, like uh, the incline barrel bench press, just to say. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm someone that, you know, if you aren't a competitive powerlifter, it's in your best interest to have general pressing strength in terms of like being able to press this angle, this angle, this angle, doing dips real good. Just because one, it's good for your shoulders to be able to strengthen them from every angle. So what I've noticed with my, let's we'll talk about myself, for example. I focused a lot primarily on bench press for the better part of, say, a year. My shoulder is starting to give me real bad problems. And I'm like, mm. what is it? Uh, it's, it's not this. It's not this. It's because I wasn't doing any overhead pressing. And what you'll find is if you're someone that has shoulder discomfort and it's not a form deficiency, you know, you're benching with good form, volume intensity is, is, is appropriate. If you're just simply not strengthening those muscles to work in this movement pattern, it'll start giving you shoulder issues. And then when you introduce that, boom, shoulder pain goes away. And then suddenly your bench gets stronger as well. A lot of people say overhead press does not have carryover to bench press. I, uh, <laughs> I, I respectfully disagree with that. I made an entire video speaking about it. That They do have carryover to one another, provided that you aren't someone that's a power lifter that's benching with a real wide grip with a real big arch, it's a relatively close grip, and your overhead press is a relatively close grip. The two are going to have carry. It's very similar. Yeah, well, I think good evidence for that is the fact that the close grip bench also feeds into the OHB, and it's because of the grip width, like you mentioned. So you're really just taking out the chest, but like when I bench press, I'm thumb away from the smooths or shoulder width. When I overhead press, it's the exact same thing. And for me personally, uh, I found them extremely important in raising the raw bench. Uh, maybe not doing them exclusively, but when they're included as like a, a second or third exercise, it just feeds into the overall program and it finishes off your delts and tries, especially because the close grip, you're going to go through a longer range of motion when you bench. And therefore, your anterior delts and triceps need to be stronger. So the brute force strength you gain from the OHB, it, it absolutely, it's, it's never going to make you weaker let's just put it like that absolutely so like you have like final form freezing shoulders like you're just you got planets for shoulders your your bench is not going to be weaker for that like you said so if you have a relatively close grip bench what you'll notice is just like you said your shoulder has to go through a more complete range of motion I, i'm not going to use all the galaxy brain terms yeah that an overhead press is essentially a close grip bench through like a different angle. Like your shoulder is going through an equivalent range of motion. That's why the two have carry over to one another. So if you go from like a 200 pound overhead press to a 250, which is actually my goal this year, 250 overhead press, Crazy. your close grip bench is going to be that much more brolic for it. Like it's going to be that much stronger. Right. So then uh, where does incline pressing play a role? in developing the raw bench because i know you're doing the butler press which mm. you've coined it's a slight inclined bench in the larson style so can you speak a little bit more about that i like incline benching it's just in general but specifically for people who have longer arms just because i'm trying not to say this in like a galaxy brain turn but with incline benching what you'll find is you have to build like mid range strength and stability because your range of motion is so much longer. And what I've found with people that have longer arms is that they do have like legitimate lockout issues that don't necessarily have to do with their triceps, if that makes sense. It's all about their pecs strength in that. Mm. And since an overhead, not an overhead, incline bench is 
a, a slightly longer range of motion than a flat press, it builds that mid-range stability. I actually like football bar bench uh, for that same purpose, you know, if you have access to it. Yeah, which uh, <laughs> that's very humbling if you try it the first time. People think they're going to lift more, but usually it's going to be a lot less. And oh, I think, uh, yeah. and the grip width makes a difference too. Closer or wide, they don't, it's not the same exercise. Absolutely. So I remember the first time I actually did a football bar bench, and it was it was embarrassing. So like at the time, this was right after I did my um, my 370 and my 385 Larson press. I'm like, okay, I'm gonna throw 315 on this thing, and it's gonna be a breeze. Mm. Luckily, I had my buddy behind me because I just got the bar. I was like, bro, come try this out with me. So he was there to spot me. Thankfully, it didn't like decapitate me or anything but i got stapled by 315 on that bar that's right insane after I did a three 370 uh larson press and a 385 like bounce press three uh bounce larson press fudge well for me there's always like uh like a 30 to 40 pound difference and one-to-one -one carryover like even if it's not as specific because you're literally pressing a neutral grip and it's it actually comes lower on the body as well right yeah. I still find it instant. Like, no matter what happens, 100% of the time, if the Swiss bar bench goes up, so does the the regular version. I think it's just because it's so freaking difficult. You have no choice but to get strong. It's true brute strength. Absolutely. What I find with this cool, because we can just talk about more of the intricacies of the football bar bench, because I really yeah. love that. And I don't feel like it's just talked about outside of, oh, it's good It's good for your shoulders. If you're shoulders. Yeah, yeah. Um. The football bar bench, like you said, it makes you bring the bar down lower on your chest. Something that I really like about it is that it makes um, pausing longer very intuitive. So when you pause on a bench press, some people have varying degrees of how much they let the bar sink into their chest. Mm. And that can get uncomfortable if you're like legitimately pausing. Since a football bar is like flat, you can pause and it won't feel like it's trying to like chop you in half, you know? So it's just more intuitive to pause on it, first of all. It also works that mid-range stability, like I said. So if you've never used a football bar before, y'all, like it'll, it does that. And it's super annoying, especially if you don't chalk your hands up where you have lifting, like lifting wraps on, like wrist wraps. Yeah. It's all those factors that contribute to it. It doesn't matter what the difference is between your football bar and your barbell bench. Your bench press will go up proportionately. So if you put 40 pounds on your football bar bench, your bench press will go up probably 30 or 40 pounds. Just stop the strength of that alone. That's crazy. And in terms of uh, muscles use, I know it's easier on the shoulders, but uh, do you feel it hits the pecs and triceps a little bit different? Like besides the whole stability aspect? Definitely. So it, it low key kind of feels like a dumbbell press almost in terms of like how much it, how much it lights your pecs up. Like for me, for instance, I think it's because since it is a neutral grip, you can kind of like do this with your elbows. It's true. Over, um, abduct them. That's a good point. And um, I'm curious about dumbbells. Do you use a lot of them in your training these days? Because I look at your workout logs and it's mostly with barbells. And then once a blue moon, I'll see you doing like incline dumbbell pressing and stuff like that. So what's the importance uh, as it pertains to specificity? That's a great question, man. So I think you could really classify a few different exercises in that slot, to be honest with you. So it just depends upon like what equipment someone has access to. I like to say there's a few things you could put in that slot for like the heck hypertrophy slot i love the football bar bench that's my favorite um i also like a hammer strength chest press so one that's plate loaded you're sitting mm -hmm. down yeah. that one i really like just because it allows you to get the full like function of your pec like so like your your pec is designed to go out exactly but also in and that's exactly what the hammer strength chest press does um, and then if you don't have access to those two things, but for some reason you have dumbbells, there's the dumbbell bench, which I actually like a lot. I just don't like, no offense to my gym, like if somebody, it works at the gym is watching this, but like the dumbbells are like, you know, oh. 
that screw on tight. So I don't typically use them for that reason, but they are good just because, like I said, they let you come out and then in unless you get a more complete function in your pecs, which is just going to beef you up a lot better, for one, which is going to correlate to more capacity in your bench press and being able to be stronger at that. Right. First of all, I feel you on the, the crappy dumbbells. I used to have that same problem. And therefore, I would never go more than like 110, 120 because they would just rattle and it felt very uncomfortable. But uh, I like how you're mentioning it's for more, for more complete chest development because you're doing the proper function, right? You're um, adducting the humerus. Now, obviously, there's no tension here, but still, it's a converging type of motion as seen in the, the hammer strength. And it's cool that you're suggesting that because a lot of people would say that machines are completely worthless for a strength athlete. So I want to know your take on that, uh, especially when talking about the Smith, Smith machine, because I've seen you do some acid grass squats like that. So what is your real opinion on some of these devices? That's interesting. Just because Natural Hypertrophy made a video that I watched the other day talking about like the, uh, like the misconception or the cognitive dissonance when comparing free weights to machines. Yeah. I agree mostly on that just because you, you really just want to look more at movement patterns and functions of the muscle when you're talking about hypertrophy. Strength is another topic, like strength at a barbell movement that's entirely different from just getting jacked. Machines that allow you to work functions of your muscle that you're not necessarily getting in a barbell variation, they're infinitely useful. And it's actually the difference between someone being not only just more jacked, but also preventing injury. So mm. we use um, Smith machine squats, for example. Regular squats tend to use your lower back musculature a lot. They tend mm -hmm. to use glutes. They tend to stretch your hamstrings at the bottom. And if you're accolading all your volume to squat variations that do that, you're not necessarily avoiding overuse if you're just attacking the same function True. different movements, you know. So a Smith machine squat in that case allows you to isolate more volume to your quads, which can typically just take way more than your lower back in absence of using your lower back. And they also let you get way more range of motion irrespective of your ankle mobility. So I can squat completely ass to floor on a Smith machine. I can't do that even with weightlifting shoes uh, mm. with barbell just because my ankles are so stiff. So it's really about finding movements that work for what you're trying to do and machines are perfect for that a lot of the time interesting stability is actually a good thing when it comes to hypertrophy training so the machines give you that with some increased range of motion and some areas like you just talked about and keep in mind it's not the only thing you're going to do so it's, it's always an addition to the program or to prevent overuse because it's like you said if you're only going to do variations of a squat that's always loading the lower back and the hips and everything then what's the point of the variation? Sure, it's, it's getting you stronger, but it's not having a favorable effect on your recovery. So on that note, it's not really about the machine then. It's more so getting a different training effect. So you, you can do the same thing with, say, a free weighted belt squat, yeah? Absolutely. So if you hear someone that just absolutely is like, I'm, I'm not going to use machines. Machines are awful. You can fulfill those slots with, a barbell motion if you're taking notice of what your body is like actually doing or like you said like a free weighted belt squat for example so if you're someone that's looking to bias your quads you're not looking to load your lower back you're looking to stay really upright um johnny candido made a great video about this is the platz squat which yeah is, you know you're standing at attention standing on like a really tall stack of plates or whatever if you don't have weightlifting shoes and you're loading the quads and it's doing the exact same thing or my favorite, we'll talk about this specifically because this is something that everybody needs to do, in my opinion, is a free weighted belt squat of some kind. Mm -hmm. It does the exact same thing. You're loading your quads. You're not loading your lower back at all. It's almost free volume. There's no reason for you not to do it. Yeah, li literally free volume. So how do you program the belt squat um, like on a squat day? Are you going to do some volume work? on? Because I've seen you do high reps on the SSB squat as well as singles and stuff like that but would you also do belt squats in the same session right after or is it more like you're going to go heavy on a barbell back squat of some kind 
and then the volume is going to be exclusively with belt squats. How, how do you mix in the two? There's, there's different ways you can go about it, bro. Quite honestly, it just, um, it depends on the lifter and it depends upon like their individual recovery capabilities. I'm lean right now. So I'm, I'm not going to do what bulk, bulked up ball down the man. Mm. But I can just illustrate my personal squat split right now and then kind of talk about it. So okay. I have two squat days uh, that are just structured in an upper lower. So upper lower, upper lower. My first squat day, I like to do sets of shit. I don't know. It's either like fives or eights. I'd have to look at my training log. I have one day where I do like fives and another day where I'll do like eights. Okay. I'll do like three sets with a top set whatever rep range I'm working with, whether it's fives or eights. And I'm just focusing on progressing that top set, mostly with the sub-maximal back down volume I do. Um, but most of my training volume is coming from those machines. So I like uh, a Dr. Mike Israel style ATG leg press. I love that. I love uh, Smith machine squats, full range of motion. I love full range of motion belt squats. I love deficit Bulgarian split squats. Like whatever I pick, the name of the game is ask the grass. I'm just going to parallel on my like, like SSB squats. That's optimal for strength and performance. But with my, you know, like all my leg volume, the name of the game is hypertrophy. Range of motion is king when you're trying to build your legs. It's literally twice as much range of motion when you're doing like an ask the grass variation. So Whatever I pick, it's going to be ass to grass. But in terms of how I progress it, to be honest, man, it's, it's unga bunga. It's beat the book. <laughs> so, um, I find that machines specifically, this is, I'm trying to get people to take the machine pill with their accessories. Okay. With machines specifically, you can push them harder without having to wor worry about technical failure in the same way that you would like a barbell squat. Because the machine is just, it's, 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 it's uh, just by mechanism of it being machine, it's maintaining stability and, and, and shit for you. So you could push a set of Smith machine squats of like way past what you thought was RPE 10. Right. Keep it in a buck and you'll, you'll get so much higher of a stimulus and you'll be spent afterwards. But in terms of like the fatigue that it generates, it's not as much as you think it would be. So I'm always someone that says, you know, set a baseline volume of work with your machines or whatever accessory you're going to use and just beat the books on it because you're only going to have it in your training program for, for so long before you rotate it anyway. So you might as well go hard on it. Right. So when talking about exercise like the, the barbell back squat, you might start to do some good morning reps and therefore your, your quads don't actually fail at the end. So the technical failure is impeding the hypertrophy effect and what you're trying to get, then the machines allow you to really just hammer that through. And do you go to failure on these or do you leave a rep or two in reserve? Because you can technically go to failure easier. So what what's your, I know you said unga boonga, but what's your approach on like training to failure in general with the accessories? That's great. So I'd like to define unga boonga. It's something that I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everybody should learn just because with a lot of things, there's room for idiosyncrasies and intricacy and whatnot, but some things it's just really as simple as work hard. Um, by hunga bunga, I mean, let's just say, for example, you, week one of a program, you don't want to use the most volume and most weight and everything that you can because you got nowhere to go if that's what you just start off. You sacrifice your soul on a leg press like Tom Platts. Where do you go from there? You know, um, I'd say start with like a rep or two or three in reserve, get a feel for the movement, lay down like a baseline of three sets that you're going to do throughout your four week training block before you tackle your training block. Go from three reps in reserve to two reps in reserve to failure, which you think is failure, and mm. then you beat books on that. So, with squats especially, RPE scales a little bit differently, like rate of perceived exertion. For those that don't know what that is, it's just you rate it from a scale of 1 to 10. It's based off of how many reps you have in reserve. What you think is an RPE 5 on squats might be like an RPE 10. Just because like 315 pounds on your back is going to feel... It always heavy. feels heavy, yeah. 
it always feels heavy even when you squat 600 pounds. So you may only think like, dang, that was, that was an RP5. And then I'm like, okay, take it to failure. And then you do 20 reps. So that's why like for lower body accessories, especially, I say it's better to air closer to what you think is failure than further away. True. Well, it's like with leg press, you'll never see someone go on a failure because uh, it's just too painful. And if you ask them to, then you'll see the actual strain. It's like, oh, crap, I had another three, four reps. So uh, you mentioned, I think you just said it, three to four reps in uh, in reserve as a starting point. Uh, Why that high as opposed to being one or two reps in reserve? I'm always someone that says you want to start off with the minimum effective dose. You don't need very much to homeostasis. Your body Mm -hmm. has that point, right? You don't need but so much to create an adaptation from that. So if you can create an adaptation with six, you know, RP six or four reps in reserve or whatever, do that. Then you can then create a training adaptation with three reps in reserve instead of four and then two and then failure. You're just trying to milk out the amount of time that you can build muscle. Versus if you just go in and you go to failure every time, where do you, like yeah. I said, where do you go from there? Like you can't keep, keep doing that and maintain your performance. One, uh, a lot of people will injure themselves going to failure all the time. Like I know Mike, the Mike Menser memes are cool and all that, but you know, it's not a good training system for most people. And that's why you, you have nowhere to go. Right. Right. So you're basing this off a, a long-term approach and In general, I see you talk a lot about step loading. So can you speak a little bit more about what that entails for those who don't know? Step loading is awesome, bro. So step loading for those that don't know is essentially, like I said, you start off with um, a minimum like dose of volume. So it might be three sets of 12. How I like to do it is it's called step loading because you increase volume in steps, like literally in steps, and you, your percentages go up when you increase volume as well. So you'll start off with maybe three sets of 12 was like what I, what I like to start people off at. Then the next week, you'll go four sets of 12, and you use the exact same weight that you used the week prior. Even if it feels easy, easy is good. Easy is good tonnage that you know you're going to get in, and you're going to hit every single rep. It's good for your mindset, and it's just good for not overtraining. And then you go to five sets of 12 and you go from at five sets of 12. That's your third week. You go to three sets of eight and then you do the same thing. So you go three sets, of eight, four sets, of eight, five sets, of eight, Then you go to fives or fours or whatever. You'll find that when you come back to your 12s, because then you've done ascended the staircase, you come back down. You're much better at 12s than you were when you first started. So if you start with like you use bench press, for example. It's what most people's favorite lift is. If you start with three sets of 12 at a buck 85, you go through step progression, step loading. You may come back to your 12s and be doing 200 pounds, and it'd be just as easy as the 185 because you use that sub maximal volume, never missed any reps, never had any grinders, and you just got in and you got in the work, the tonnage, the quality volume. The quality work, yeah. It's so much better. It's so much better for main movement specifically. So like bench variations, that the variations, squat variations. Okay. And is that what you personally use with uh, your berserk method? Absolutely. Yeah. So I like to kind of combine the step loading with some harder variation of a barbell movement. So it may be like a step loaded Larson press or step loaded close grip bench step loaded stiff leg deadlift whatever the case may be so it's always with that main barbell movement or with a very close variation of it it's the best bang for your buck with step loading right right and it's uh not for every movement in the program it's only allocated for some stuff yeah yeah so it's really only for that main movement now your main uh course for the day so right right I, I guess uh i would compare it to i don't know the max effort method or the dynamic effort method that's the start of the session and then everything else is just your accessory uh, hypertrophy work you're trying to build upon that so where do percentages come into play with this do you do you use them at all in your workouts like say 70 percent of a of a training max or using certain wave progressions or is it really just about reps in reserve 
That's a great question, bro. It really, it really depends on what I'm trying to accomplish in my training and what tool in the toolbox I want to use. Because I'll use all of those or none of those, depending upon you know, okay. what I typically. But we can just talk about some instances where I have you. For step loading, you always want to use uh, like set percentages that you're going to just increase volume with. So we use 12s, 8s, and 5s, for example. For 12s, 65% is good. For 8s, like 73, even 70% is good. And then mm -hmm. for fives, like 75, 78% is good. The idea is that you're wanting to pick a sub maximal percentage. So you're not going to pick your 12 rep max and then try to exactly, yeah, five sets of 12 with that. You're going to do something that you could probably do 15 reps with. You know what I mean? That's how I we'll just use percentages and how I like using just straight percentages for sets across. Another way that I like to use percentages is I like to base maybe a top set, like a percentage-based top set, and then do RPE-based back downs, or the opposite of that. I'll do like an RPE-based top set and then percentage back downs based off of that. That's like more complicated. Well, it's cool that you're incorporating it all because there's bias on both ends, right? Some guys just don't use percentages at all. It's 100% RPE-based, and uh, others, it's the opposite. So you basically follow a maximized program. You're doing it all. And I like that there's an emphasis on, you know, hypertrophy, all the difficult exercises. There's no weak links that you can have and you're paying attention to overuse and just being this badass that continuously gets better year round without setbacks. I appreciate that, man. I think you and I are very similar in that regard because we share many of the same, um, you know, philosophies in terms of you don't want to have any weak links in what you're training. You want to pay attention to your recovery. You know, bulk. Yeah. Talk about that for for guys that are you know cutting or in, or main gaining right now. But uh, and you just just make sure that you're robust. You're doing the best that you can, and you stay on the road like you're just consistent. With it. Yeah. So uh, you just talked about main gaining. Are you doing it right now? Because you 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 seem to be in the low 170s and you're still lean as. <laughs> so what's happening there? Not purposely. So the, the way that that works for me, I can just talk a little bit about my, myself so that you know, everybody can get to know me a little bit better. I'm someone that can stay lean very easily, like to the like annoyingly easily. Like I'm trying to gain weight. I'm increasing calories and like my my neat goes up, my non-exercise uh, thermogenesis, which will then just make it go back down to maintenance again. What I would say for people like that, because there's probably, you know, there may be a few people that when they increase calories, it's like I can never eat enough. There are people like that. You really just want to keep slowly increasing every couple of weeks. Your body is not going to be able to make you walk around and twitch and move your foot infinitely. Like you're eventually just going to be in a calorie surplus. So for people right. like that, don't be discouraged. I, I can relate to you in that regard to those who are watching and relate to that. Just keep increasing your calories. Keep tracking them accurately. You're eventually going to start gaining weight. And to your point, annoyingly, I've been staying at 172 pounds um, for the better part of uh, a month and a half, I would say. And I've increased, like, objectively from 2,600 to 3,200 calories. And it really just is the non-exercise thermogenesis because everything in terms of my activity level and, like, training is otherwise normal. That's crazy. And I find that when you come back from being really lean, there might be a slight rebound in weight. But after that, it seems pretty easy. Like your set point is different from what it used to be. Like for me, I can easily maintain 170, even while eating like a, what I perceive to be a nut job, you know, instead of going back to being 10, 15 pounds above that. So maybe it's also the deficit. You were so disciplined and you learn to eat smaller portions of food that it's just harder even though like technically you're still eating a lot more food now absolutely so we can um we can talk about that main gaining piece a little bit because anyone that follows me knows that like i don't you know that's not the answer for most people like you can't expect to not gain any weight and also be able to gain strength and size if you see anybody doing that there's one of two possibilities well three one is they're just like new to training 
what's applicable to most people. Two is you're on steroids, which I, you know, we'll talk about that later because I don't condone that personally at all. Or three, it's just someone that's genetically inclined to be able to do that. You know, just they're naturally a leaner person, whatever mechanisms that allow them to be able to make gains in a deficit or maintenance. That's just that's not typical. That yeah. doesn't apply to everybody. I want to cut you off real quick. There's a fourth thing, too. Uh, you can you can still do it, but it's not optimal compared to the alternative. Which is bulk. There you go. So like even if you are even if everyone is theoretically able to do it for the rest of their life which you know what i i think it is possible right you'll get better gains if you bulk, and it doesn't have to be a massive surplus it could be a lean bulk slowly gaining weight over time that is the optimal way so we have to understand it's it's a trade-off of what you're trying to do for some people it might be worth it but for most i would say uh it's probably not the best route after a certain level in my opinion Absolutely. So I agree in that regard. So I think if your goal is to get like more jacked and feel good while you train and, you know, not have nagging injuries and tweaks and things like that, a small surplus where you're not really going to notice any weight gain month to month in terms of like my physique looks worse, you will gain weight, but you won't get fat month to month. That's just going to be so much more productive for everybody. And I just like to extend this to everybody watching to say, if you eat in a small surplus, you may not notice anything more than like a pound gain per month. But that surplus is still allowing you to progress in your training. Muscle gain is slow either way, y'all. Like, exactly. You can go the entire year. I can go the entire year in a surplus and gain five pounds of muscle. Month to month, that's not going to seem like very much. And if I get married to this number on the scale, in terms of it's not going up four pounds per month. I'm not getting mm-hmm. mess so many pe- more people up than not. I think when we talk about bulking, we need to escape the idea that we're getting tremendous amounts of weight. This is done dirty style. No. Uh, just to say, like in 2019, at the start, I was like 163. And then at the very end, 169. So six pounds of fat gain in the whole year and gaining all kinds of strength in the process. That's pretty worthy trade-off if you ask me and a small mini cut will take off that weight anyway so as long as you keep yourself in check there's really nothing to worry about and that beats the alternative of trying to be like the absolute lowest for your body weight especially if you're going to be shredded or like in the 10 to 12 percent range you know like your actual body fat makes a difference with this your body fat will do so much to just improve the quality of your training. Not only just let, let you eat more food. It also like cushions your joints and everything to where like I've noticed, like just again, give, give a little anecdote. I've noticed that I get tweaks and injuries that mm. I get when I'm lean that I do not get when I'm heavy. And it's simply yeah. On better recovery, but just the fat around your joints and stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, you see a lot of shredded people tearing their pec. And uh, obviously, there's probably drugs that play a role in that. But just to say, you're less resilient when you're barely eating anything and you're excessively low in body fat. And one thing I never said on my channel, but you, you're mentioning the, the pec strains and you are natty. For me, it had nothing to do with upper body, but my I started getting like hip adductor pain. And I've never had that in my entire life. I, this is the first time I disclosed this. But I was like, what the fuck is going on? It didn't matter what I was doing. I was getting these nagging. Bro, it was so weird. And that's because I was too low. <laughs> you know? And you know, man, stuff like that is always good feedback. Because it tells you, like, okay, enough cutting. I'm done cutting. No more cutting. But it also gives you uh, knowledge just to be able to navigate injuries and stuff. I think that's yep. really important for longevity, actually, like knowing how to navigate injuries. I don't like the fact that I tweaked my pec, not even training. I don't like the fact that I've had hamstring tendinopathy. I don't like the fact that my elbows ache sometimes. But mm. it's when things happen, you go through that struggle. You go through the navigation process. You learn how to, to pre- prevent them. But also just when they happen, how to circumvent them as quickly as possible. Yeah. Tweak strings and rehab them very quickly just because i know how to do that yeah and when you rehab it 
you learn from your mistakes and you're likely not to experience that again. And you can bring that back to your clients. So you're in the trenches, you've experienced these issues, and now you can offer that back to the community. And it ends up being win-win in this regard, so long as you don't give up. Because many people will get a little injury and then they'll let it consume them. And I think an active approach of figuring out what caused it and recognizing like you might be a little bit sensitive in some regards, that's where exercise selection comes into play. And I think too, it's a sign, like when you're really shredded and certain areas are getting snapped up, maybe it's an indicator that like surplus or not, those are areas you gotta look out for. So for you, it was the pec, right? Maybe when you're getting to a 500 pound bench, you, you would start to experience that again because of that extremely long range of motion. And you were just more prone in that super lean state, which is like a future sign. Not necessarily what you're going through right now, but it's, it's a proxy, you know? Yeah, it's like a, like you said, it's a proxy for what could go on. In the future. Yeah, yeah. That's a great point that you raised, actually, that I, I neglected to talk about. If you're lean, this is just a, like a cautionary tale to like people who are lean. They're trying to get a big bench press and their arms are really long. You want to look out for things that relate to like not only your pec, but also anything that like attaches into your bicep as well. Mm. People don't think about bicep tendon overuse on bench press just because most people don't have long arms. But when you go through that maximal extreme Davy Jones locker range of motion, your bicep does get stretched at the bottom. Your yeah. pec will get stretched at the bottom. And it's just when you're le when you're leaner, that connective tissue isn't recovering as quickly. Your range of motion is a little bit longer because you don't get that fat pad between your chest and your True. back. And it's just something that you have to look out for more, especially for you longer on guys. True. Without that extra cushion, you're putting an even greater range of motion on that already sensitive area. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, for the bicep, it, it is a stabilizer in the bench press. And I think, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but did you talk about in your tendinopathy video maybe staying away from chin-ups if you're starting to get uh, pain on your bench press because you are stretching the chest and, and bicep uh, when you do that. Mm -hmm. So that's that's actually something excellent that we can talk about because much of your audience as well as mine, they like weighted calisthenics. Yeah, like yeah. Dips and bench press and stuff. And they also like being lean. Um, something that you don't think about, like you said, you get that stretch when you do any sort of overhead pulling movement. If you're pushing volume on your dips, your bench press, whatever the case may be, your recovery is lower, you're leaner, it's all these things compound into what could have just been you could do more pull-ups after your dips. Now you have to start to think about other ways to work your back. Mm -hmm. Like we talked about before, when you work muscles repetitively, it's not most conducive to staying injury free it just doesn't apply to using similar movement patterns sometimes it really is subjecting them to stretch repetitively so you're dead hanging with i've done 180 pound pull-ups uh chin-ups pull-ups whatever any grip that's combined with my body weight a lot of stretch on my pec that i'm doing after my bench pressing and you know yeah. that's just they can creep up on you over time that I never thought about until it happened. I don't know everything. Yeah, and even if you don't get injured, you still might notice a recovery uh, effect. Like when I was uh, on my journey last year for the benching, I had to cut out the, the chin-ups. And I didn't even realize at the time, but it's for the exact reason that you just described. I noticed my recovery wasn't as good. And I was like, I mean, it's a vertical pull. I'm working the back, but there's something more that I can't exactly pinpoint. And that's what it was that extra stre stretch. So that's where like, the stronger you get, the more you gotta know about exercise variety and blending the system. And one mm -hmm. thing you always talk about is lower back recovery and how that's a limited resource. So these days, uh, like if you're gonna do a free way to, free way to row, it better be uh, chest supported or something that's such a deep range of motion that you can get more or less weight. But in general, I see you doing uh, seal rows and very difficult back exercises that don't put extra stress on the spinal rectors. Yeah, we could talk about that. So those those rows that don't put extra stress on your spinal rectors, those, I'm going to be honest with you, like I know that most like beginner level programs teach barbell rows and things like that. 
I'm always more of the opinion that you should start to introduce elements that you're going to start be using long term. So the chest okay. bro is so good in my opinion because like you said, it spares your lower back and that allows you to do more hip hinging volume, more squats. The reason why I really love seal rows is because most people can set them up, you know, like in a home gym type of setup. You know, even if you don't have like the seal row bench, you can put your bench on some plyo boxes and do seal rows that way. You could also use uh, seal rows with dumbbells. So if you have like, yep. a dumbbell or something like that, that lets you get that full protraction and retraction, which is really good as an accessory for seal rows if you care to have a big seal row. But also it's like really good for bodybuilding type work, like hypertrophy. So if that's something that you needed to replace weighted pull-ups or chin-ups with, it's like a no-brainer in my opinion. It's what I've been doing recently, actually. I haven't done a weighted chin-up in maybe three months now. Do mm. you uh, plan on doing them again, though? Like, say, setting 200 pounds on that lift? Or do you, are you starting to care less about it as time passes by? I, I definitely want to get a 200 pound weighted pull up i would just have to be in a headspace where i'm not benching okay as much because I've, I've just gotten to the point where like i'm so strong at my bench press and i have to do so much intensity and volume with it that i don't really have the room for anything that's going to take away from that um, yeah and if i'm ever like more of a maintaining state of mind in terms of my bench press or i might not be training at all who knows yeah um, Definitely, that's when I would go for the 200 pound weighted pull up. I didn't even really peak or really specialize for it the when I did the, the 180 or whatever it was. So I'd be interested to see how far you could really take it if you treated it like a bench press. Like that's all mm -hmm. you did. Yeah. Well, it goes back to um, specialization and where you want to allocate your volume because everything, it's going to be a trade off. And I think also you talk about when focusing on the big three, it's really two of them that, that are going to get the most emphasis. And the other one is really just hypertrophy work to raise your boot strength. And you just mentioned like you didn't do any real peaking, yet you were still able to do weighted chins with four plates. I think that shows the power of focusing on just getting bigger and brute force difficult exercises. Like you don't necessarily have to do these complicated waves to demonstrate your performance. You can walk in any day and do pretty good. And that's pretty much what I did as well with the four plate pull up. You can say the max effort variations were slightly more specific, but at the end of the day, if you're strong, you're freaking strong. You don't need three weeks or whatever, even though that is going to show the, the highest potential. Absolutely. So I think to your point, people are always concerned with like the highest potential. They think that you have to peak, you have to do all this. I'm always someone that says a lift is only as technical as you make it. So if you get just generally stronger, you're going to get generally stronger. It's as simple as you make it as it's complicated as you make it. So if you, your back just over the course of a year gets bigger, wider, stronger, you may not have done a chin up for four months, five months, but you've gotten generally stronger and a chin up is not a technical movement. You know what I mean? It provided. Yeah. The, like you were doing the singles 90 percent or more on anything it could be a seal row it could be anything mm -hmm. act related you're going to be stronger weighted pull-ups more than likely way stronger yeah and if you're not stronger right away eventually you will because you just have more muscle and you can actualize that and what are your thoughts on lap pull-downs to raise the weighted pull because i've seen you max out the stack on those do you think there is carryover because some people say there isn't but is it maybe because they're just too weak it's because they're too weak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm someone where like, I'm, I'm a kind guy, I'm very personable, but like, if your issue is, I have to say it bluntly to you, I'm gonna say it. Like, you're, you're, you're too weak if you think that. Lap pull downs are really good in my opinion, it's because they're a deviation in terms of like different, like the, the strength curve is different from a, a weighted pull up a little bit. So it avoids a little bit of overuse, but it also just allows you to get in more volume especially if you're using something with like a cambered hand a cambered handle mm -hmm. where you can get like a deeper like even deeper uh -huh. than depth bar you know something like that um i feel like they're really good for just for differentiating like you know variations that you want to use so you'd have one day where you're 
weighted pull up focused and then another day where you know you may open up with that lat pull down and then do some other accessories it just allows you to differentiate it's always better to have more tools than less absolutely yeah and, and that's what you also did with um, your smaller modification instead of just doing hammering away the classic bench you introduced some variations and other stuff but um yeah i want to go back to the pull-ups so the lat pull downs you just mentioned doing that extreme range of motion with the camera, right? Mm -hmm. Now, obviously you can do that with pull-ups as well, but that's the sternum pull-up. And I don't think a lot of people have um, the strength capacity to do that right away. Or if they do, um, it's hard to hit failure, I found, because you're eventually just gonna do regular chin. So you might get like seven sternum pull-ups and then you can still bang out more, but it's just chin over the bar. So in a way, you could kind of call that cheat reps, right? Absolutely. So it's, it's, that's a good way to look at it, actually, like looking at it in terms of it just it's a implement that allows me to essentially train that uh, Vince, Vince Gironda style pull up with less technical proficiency and just be able to push it to failure more easily just because you can always like subtract weight from a lat pull down. You can't subtract weight from your body weight unless you use bands or something. But it's just so much more practical to get up on a lat pull down and if you wanted to train a, a pull that has this range of motion, you could just slash maybe 40 pounds off and do that. Get so much more of a hypertrophy effect. Yeah. Now, uh, you have an aesthetic back. It's wide, it's thick, it's functional. You built it through doing classic movements, yeah? What are your thoughts on some of the new biomechanically sound exercises? Like how that compares to weighted pull-ups and stuff like that. Like basically... Uh, do you do like single arm pull downs with the weight coming in front of you like this and you're really trying to bias the lats? Do you do it bilaterally? Like, what are your thoughts on this new age of biomechanics? I'm not someone where I'm just going to say something agreeable just because it sounds good. I'm always somebody that says, focus on strength. Where the strength comes, the size will follow. Yes, it's technically correct. We're okay if your arms are tucked more in you're doing it one arm at a time and you're keeping your arm tucked in okay that fulfills a function of your lats that you might not necessarily get on like a wider grip pull up that you're just doing for strength but what you also have to take into account with things like that pull down that you just mentioned is that your, your load is going to be limited and thus mm. the overall stimulus that you can get there's only but so far that you can progress on an isolation movement like that so to primarily base your back training around that, I think it's kind of addressing a problem that doesn't exist. Like no one that gets a big weighted pull up is gonna have a small back, um, in my opinion. At least. I'm not sure what your thoughts on that are, but I, I think they're fine as like icing on the cake. I just don't think that the icing can replace the cake, in my opinion. Right. Yeah, my, my general thoughts is, uh, I think it's good to know more about that stuff. And I, and I include a little bit now and just understanding how the arm placement biases different parts is is good for minimizing overuse. So I look at it in an athletic performance standpoint, knowing that a wide grip pull up is not the same as a neutral uh, medium grip pull up. So I use that to understand what the variations bring me, because back in the day we would say, OK, you're you're changing the grips of the pull ups. But what is that actually doing? So a chin versus an overhand, okay, we can talk about the biceps, but what else? How does that affect what you're doing with the movement pattern? So I, I look at it like that, similar to a powerlifter comparing a close grip bench to a, a wide grip bench or a Swiss bar. But in terms of like the results, it's as you say, nobody who gets really strong at these time-tested movements is small. Like you, you, if someone could do three plates for like five to 10 reps on a way to pull up, they're going to have a, a nice back, you know, especially if they're not those super lightweight guys, because uh, I think that's one of the issues with some calisthenics practitioners. Uh, they're just really lean and lightweight, like 135, 140 pounds, and they can display these decent numbers. But when you look at the total weight, it's nothing really that impressive. And then they complain that they're small, but really it goes back to the same problems that guys in the weight training community have. They're not eating enough and in, in general it's not a lot of weight period yeah it's it's like this weird mindset where people 
think that it's more favorable just to be small all the time. And then that relative strength makes up for their lack of absolute strength. I think relative strength is cool just as a yep. side of actually being strong, being jacked and stacked. Um, I guess in terms of just to circle back on the, um, the, the uh, like a lot of the new biomechanics and things like that, I think, like you said, it's good to know. It's good to know that, you know, this is different from this is different from yeah. this. In terms of how you can apply those same biomechanic strategies to basic movement. So you can get a closer, you know, arms more flush to your, your, your torso grip with a pull-up and then just do that as opposed to just focusing on that single arm. Exactly. Twisty, twisty guy. Yeah. And even um, the direction of your arms, right? Because now uh, apparently ver straight vertical is not the best for the lats. You want it slightly in front of you. Well, that, that can be accomplished just by changing your body angle on, on pull-ups. It might not be straight out, but you're still getting uh, – it's like people talk about the squat not being the best exercise, right, for legs. But then they'll also say it's just got to be biased enough for the quads. Well, can we say the same thing on pull-ups? Just bias it enough for the lats. Problem solved. It's like weird cognitive dissonance. So that, that's more like a power lifting thing, man. Like they can apply all these, you know, all this biomechanic knowledge to the big three. Then it's like it's like they're reading Chinese when it's like oh, pull-ups. What is this? Over it. <laughs> you can't do it this way, huh? That's why I like general strength, man, because there's one thing to know the big three and program for that. That's awesome. I respect it. Great. But it's not the same when talking about other compound movements. Like a lot of powerlifters do not know how to get a really strong one or max way to pull up. No clue. And I don't blame them for that. It's not their sport. It's funny that you said that because someone that I, I follow that I have a lot of respect for and not like you said, not talking shit or anything. He is a power lifter. It's very successful. He started doing weighted pull-ups and then was like, yo, this is the secret to getting jacked. This is the secret to looking like you lift. Like I, my total went from this to this and my physique didn't improve really at all aesthetically. But I started doing pull-ups and now I look better. I think just unless you're someone that, you know, is honest to God, someone that is a competitive strength athlete that absolutely needs to specify on just three lifts. Yeah. Most people care about looking like they lift, like having some shape. That's a fact. You got to include things that are for strength, but also will give you that look that you're looking for. I agree. Like most people, I think they lie to themselves also and say, oh, I don't care about aesthetics, but they, they often talk about it. So it's like, really? I think they do, but they just got so dialed in and they're good at their sport that you know, that becomes a new specialty. But deep down inside, they want to look better. They want to look better. Most most people care about looking decent, you know. Most people do. Yeah. With your philosophy, you always say that form follows function. So what are some important compound movements that when you get really strong with them, your physique's just going to look out of this world? Like, what are some strength standards that you can give for the average person or maybe someone who's uh, not so blessed? That when they get this, they're going to look like they lift. This is a real easy one, honestly. So with, with that, you want to think big range of motion, works a lot of muscles, and you can load it easily. And we'll talk about not even the average person. We'll talk about someone with poor genetics. So the, the, the imaginary slender man that has poor leverages on all three lifts simultaneously. Mm. <laughs> um, close grip bench press. So that's going to be shoulder width. It's going to have the most range of motion at any bench press you can do. 315 for three, three or five reps. Anybody in the world can do that. Even the most genetically garbage person in the world. If you have two arms that work, you have food, and you sleep eight hours a night, and you don't have a disease that would inhibit you to be able to build muscle or digest nutrients, you can reach that. You have look jacked in the upper body. Let me, let me cut you off real quick. How long would it take, uh, like as an estimation, for someone who's just cursed and that's like anyone in the world could do it? But what's a realistic time frame 
for a number like that? Like if you're a complete jabroni and you, you gave yourself, and this is with optimized program, five years. Five years. Like you start from the bar five years later. At most, like seven. Like it doesn't. If you just look at things, and, and people tend to limit their own progression by pushing too hard too fast. Mm. If you just look at it as like every four weeks, I'm going to put five or ten pounds on my bench. And you add that up over years, that's going to contribute to a large result over time that just seems like nothing. You know, piece mm -hmm. by piece. So provided that you're pacing yourself well, you're not maxing out all the time pushing for PRs when it's appropriate, you're sleeping, you're bulking, um, five to seven years for any of these strength standards. And this is telling people what they need to hear because a lot of people have low standards and it's not justified. It's because they've been following people who have no idea how to program and they would realize that very quickly if they follow someone like you and actually did things right stop making excuses put in the proper work and give it the years that it takes and that little those prs they accumulate it's like you say five pounds i do the same thing like when i use the max effort method and i go back to variation i'll add five pounds it's f all it's nothing but you repeat that over many training cycles and now you got a freaking 40 pound pr and then a 40 pound pr turns into an 80 pound pr turns into oh i benched 300 four years ago. Now I bench 420. And then there you go. You look like a you look like a super saiyan version of yourself. Like you if you could take two of you and they put on Potara earrings, you would be the fusion <laughs> of yourself. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well you, you can't not look better. You know assuming like uh like okay maybe you, you, you got fluffier but the moment you get back like we talked about before to that initial lean weight you're gonna be heavier and look more jacked. And those measurements will prove that as well. Going back to the standards, I cut you off before. 315 for three, close good bench for upper body. What else? Yeah, so we'll, we'll go upper upper body then lower. And we'll use some of my favorite lifts that I like that are yeah. like hard, harder versions, big range of motion. Um, we'll do a weighted pull up, uh, and that's with you know chin over the bar or chin up. It doesn't matter. 135. Five, you know, that'll, that'll give, and, and provided that you're like between 180 and 200 pounds, you're not a lightweight or anything. Like a middle yeah. weight, somewhat lean, you know? Yeah, you know, and this, the cumulative weight is about between 300 and 320 pounds between the yeah. and body weight for like five reps. 100%. Back, yeah. Now with rows, uh, we use seal row, for example, you get like a, a, a 250 seal row for one. Your upper back is going to look jack. Squat, the most genetically abhorrent person on the planet that doesn't have a leg missing, they can digest food. You can you can get a four or five barbell squat for yeah. a couple. Of years. You can. I'm not going to lie to you. Um, stiff leg deadlift or an RDL, three fifteen for maybe like eight reps, your lower back is going to look jacked. Your hamstrings are going to be jacked. And that's with a full range of motion. You're using actual stiff legs. You're not squatting into it at all. It's a proper hip hinge. You, mm -hmm. RDL is something to where you don't need to go to the bar to get a really good stimulus. It's kind of like a good morning. Mm -hmm. uh, and like when you compare the, the squat morning versus the actual good morning. And that's something I, I realized in myself. I was like, I'm, I'm pulling – damn near 600 pounds and i'm using a fraction of the load of some of these other guys doing good mornings what the fuck is going on oh well it's simple they're using garbage form that's all there is to it they're bending their knees like crazy it's that's not even a good morning <laughs> like your body weight for three to five sets of 20 should be more than enough for that exercise rdls are the same way um so i'll just you know People will have like 500 pounds on RDL and then rep it up, but then you see it and it's just like the most abysmal form. They're squatting into every rep where it's basically like it's less of a pure hip hinge and it's more like a partial deadlift with a stretch. 
it's being less specific. So they're they're bending, they're not actually hinging at the hips, like you said. They'll bring it like directly to their knee and they won't try to push it. So we're trying to push the maximum hip flexion, right? They're not even getting close to that. And therefore, you're not gonna like for good hypertrophy movements, you want a good range of motion and get that stretch reflex out of the bottom. Uh, either by doing just a regular RDL where you're properly sitting back or you, even the deficit version, which is also very hard. We'll talk about that more in just one second. I got to grab my charger. The RDL is something that is, you can scale it very easily provided that you're being objective with yourself about what you're doing. With it. So we'll take most power lifters, for example, most power lifters, if you have them do, cause I, I train a lot of power lifters you have them do an RDL or a good morning and they have absolutely no idea how to hip hinge. They don't. But the cool thing with an RDL is that it's something that you can scale over time. So I always tell people with an RDL or anything like a good morning, go the lowest with your back angle that you can without bending your knees or without rounding your lower back a whole mm -hmm. lot. The second that you have to start to squat down into your hip hinge to get that range of motion that you're looking for, just stop. Stop to wherever you can do and just progress that over time. What you'll find is you'll build the flexibility in your hamstrings because that's like the limiting factor most of the time. What if someone doesn't have flexibility issues, but their range of motion on RDLs is, is just not that big because of leverages? Like, would you tell them to intentionally go deeper, even though it's not like the hamstrings that are doing that? If they're limited by anthropometry in terms of their range of motion, I always say the goal with an RDL is you get as close to the floor as you can. You know, the plates, you know, they can even touch the floor just as long as you're not completely resting them. Like you can tap. Okay. Touching and, that, and not bouncing either, obviously. And not, and not bouncing either, right. So I would say in that case, if they're looking to get more range of motion, just moving your grip out or standing on plates is something that's, you know, someone that just inherently has a shorter range of motion can do. I, I encourage that. That's what I do myself. I, I only RDL from a deficit now. Only? Yeah, and I don't even have a short range of motion. My, mine is pretty decent without the wow. deficit. Do you see yourself going back to the regular way or not really? Because it's an accessory, right? And you have more ROM, so it's good for hypertrophy. Like, we try to escape black and white thinking. But how much better is the deficit version, really? I wouldn't say the deficit is necessarily better or worse. When people ask me, you know, just different questions on social media, like how good is this accessory? How good is this one? Mm -hmm. You should only really use something if you need to. So right. if you've already milked through all the progressions of RDLs, you can touch the floor with them. And they're like a, basically a stiff legged deadlift. That's essentially what a, a good RDL is. And then you add deficits over time. It's just the natural progression of the lift. I really only ever notate it in my own personal training log. It's just still RDL. It's just I can oh. build flexibility. Okay. More. Yeah. So. I gotcha. So it's basically exactly what you said before. As you build a flexibility, you get more familiar with the movement. You're properly hip hinging. That's just a natural progression of what's going to happen. Just like uh, a beginner is probably not going to do a Larson press, but as he gets more advanced, he likely will. So the exercise selection changes to fit your needs as it pertains to your strength and flexibility, and anthropometry, all that. Absolutely, absolutely. And even when you look at um, uh, Niku Vlad, that's the guy who came up with uh, the RDL. He was an Olympic weightlifter, world-renowned Olympic weightlifter, just to call him the weightlifter is disrespectful to him but he came up with the rdo and he actually used it from a deficit that's just like the generic version wow of how it was originally used by the guy that came up with it so i just feel so, like that's the natural progression of the movement over time you're just going to be able to get more and more stretch on your hamstrings get uh, closer to parallel or below parallel mm -hmm. angle with your back that's just the natural progression of the movement. And that's why it's such a great builder for deadlifts. Because you use so little weight compared to a, what you would have to do for rep work, equivalently for a deadlift. And you get so much better of a stimulus. It's just... It's amazing. You actually see a lot of power lifters doing that these days. They'll do RDLs. Yeah. It, they've become... Uh, well, they made a name for themselves because they work and they have a great stimulus to fatigue ratio. And that's something that people won't understand. 
until they're pulling in the 500s, in my opinion. Anything below that, like you don't know. The recovery effects are insane. Let's just put it like that. You feel like garbage if you do heavy ass deadlifts for rep work. And the RDL, you know, you're stripping it down so much, but it's the same stimulus on the, the prime movers of the deadlift. So the carryover is going to be one to one, provided you don't have like sticks for quads, and uh, and your technique is dialed in. So for your form, how big of a deficit is it? Like you stand on on bumper plates, yeah. But like, what's the inches about? And do you plan on increasing that even further if you're able? That's a good question, man. I don't know about the future so much because I'm still milking the deficit that I'm on. Yeah, yeah. I have my my weightlifting shoes have an a inch and a half heel. So it's that plus the bumper plate, which is like two and a half or three inches, I think. So it's like a four, four and some inch deficit. Wow. And you're doing it with uh, weightlifting shoes. Um, some people said never to do that on hip hinges. What are your thoughts on that? I think, so it just depends upon what you're trying to work. So with weightlifting shoes, what they'll do is they'll cause you to pitch more forward that way. That actually is the way that RDLs were meant to be performed to begin with. They were an exercise for your back. And when you're tipped mm. forward like that, you're not, not using your hamstrings or your glutes, but you're also using your spinal erectors more. Where it becomes like you shouldn't do that is because people don't stay extended and keep their spinal erectors engaged at the bottom. Uh, but they'll flex a whole bunch. Okay. So you just got to use proper form and this isn't really a concern. It's just like with anything, man. It's like people who say you shouldn't go below parallel on dips. I, I touch my yeah, you, bars on dips, you know, bro. I've never seen anyone do range of motion like you. <laughs> when I saw, uh, what was that? What was that number you did? It was like 200 pounds or 225. Um, yeah, I think it was I think, five plates. Yeah, I think my best weighted dip uh, was 230, 230 pounds. And that was just a yeah. period I had rotated in at the time. Yeah, and I did the same thing, bro. It was just a max effort variation, but you did it with such a range of motion. I was like, holy. Fuck. But what's interesting is, um, you don't do a lot of them these days, right? Because. Uh, they're less specific to the bench. Like a weighted push up would be a better a better choice in that case. And if you want the same range of motion of a dip, you can do deficit version. So like uh where do you program weighted calisthenics for raising the bench press? I love weighted calisthenics for the bench press. I think that for most people, low key, they're better options than a lot of the shit that they do. Really, eh? Thing is because most people know how to do a push up. Or they know how to do a dip or they have you know even on like a limited equipment op like situation where someone's training yeah. them, they they might have a barbell and a squat rack and they're definitely not going to have anything else loading up a backpack like the videos that you just made the one that you just post i really love yeah it. funny story i'm gonna tell about my backpack in a little bit yeah, i want to hear that story <laughs> <laughs> I've only alluded to it in my own comment section, but we'll talk about like training stuff first. So, all right, deficit weighted push-ups. Legitly, I use less weight on those than I do on those extreme range of motion dips, rep for rep, set for set. Like a hundred pounds less. And you would think that, like, you think, okay, dips are harder than push-ups. Not when you add that deficit into play. Yeah. And uh, what I love about deficit is that. It's a camber bar bench replacement, so you don't need to buy another barbell. And most gyms don't even have that anyway. But the majority have plyometric boxes, so anyone can do it. You just got to get a backpack, provided that it doesn't get stolen. Yeah, provided that it doesn't get stolen. So how I like to program deficit-weighted push-ups, it just depends upon how long their arms are, like, like, like we talked about. Um, now, if their arms are shorter, I like using it more of like a like you're doing this and you're progressing with the intent of getting stronger at it. This is your main variation after your bench okay. press. Because it's like a camber bar bench press that you don't have to spend any money on. It's, you know, you can do it anywhere. Now, for people with longer arms, we get a lot of range of motion on our bench press just by default anyway. You know, we're getting yeah. that maximum stretch. I really like to use that as like a, a preparatory movement to like warm up for bench press. Oh, for and then for two, like a lower grade movement that we're going lighter on just to build more resiliency through that big range of motion. So it's super valuable either way, bro. They're one of my favorite exercises. 
Interesting. Do you do other variations as well with the weighted push-up, like the decline version, uh, maybe the one uh, where you're grabbing onto a barbell? Like how many, like realistically, how many variations of the push-up are you going to do in a strength training program? Sky's the limit, bro. It's all uh, dependent upon, you know, the individual, what you're trying to do. But for me specifically, with some of my bench accessories, it really is more about building capacity in my tissue so I could just push regular bench press harder. So I'll only personally use maybe like one or two. But if someone's looking to replace multiple bench accessories and multiple uh -huh. functions, you know, like you said, you've got the barbell weighted push-up. You've got the deep deficit flat weighted push-up. You've got the decline weighted push-up, which replaces the incline bench. You have mm -hmm. the places the decline. If you're right, right. Um, you're like, dude, I don't have access to anything. How am I that? Weighted push-ups are the truth. They're they're literally just a bench press. As long as you match the per, the percentages or relative intensity, like you're good. The carryover is going to be one to one, and I mean, you just can't go wrong. And I find like if my bench goes up. So does my way to push up and vice versa. Like they literally feed into each other perfectly. You just got to do it right. Lift heavy enough weight. And most people aren't doing that. They'll slip a 45 in their bag and they'll be like, okay, I'm, I'm using this as a finisher. But if you, if you push it like a primary movement or like uh, just to replace what you do in the gym, like let's say you don't have uh, an incline bench. I, I would say a decline way to push up might be better than trying to put your, your bench on like uh, bumper plates or something because you, you might not get the right angle, you know? Mm -hmm. I would say like, this is like the, we'll segue into my backpack story because this is the conclusion. <laughs> okay. That I conclude, the, re the conclusion that I reached myself. If you have access to both, like the weighted push-ups are still better in most cases. They're just better for hypertrophy. It's just honest with you. In my opinion, in my experience, you should do enough of the bench pressing work so you're specifically good at bench pressing. But push-ups just build your serratus. They that work too. Or there's just so much more of a robust movement that you could liberally use them in your strength training program and not and get superior gains than just picking an equivalent bench variation, in my opinion. Um, now, that's why I started bringing my backpack to the gym. Right. It was a big backpack that had mm. lots of room in it. I never would have thought in a million years that someone would steal my backpack out of my gym bag and then not like take my wallet, take my weighted chin up belt, take anything else. They took my backpack. And the funny thing is, is that they replaced it with a pair of straps. What? <laughs> <laughs> Extra pair of straps. No book. I'm looking at my, my gym bag right now. And there are two pairs of straps in there and no book bag. Wow. I, I, I don't know. It's the strangest thing that's ever happened to me. But, you know, weighted push-ups are the truth. They're superior, in my opinion, in a lot of cases. Like, people can use that liberally. Liberally, liberally. Yeah. Well, I hope the straps are good quality, for one. They're garbage. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and secondly, I hope you uh, introduce them as well again, because I'd be curious to see how much you could push them, you know? Like, if you get a, a proper backpack or even uh like a plate loaded vest like this could be one of the keys in taking our bench to the next level you know like imagine doing 225 for three sets of 10 full range of motion i'm thinking to the point where i might even like i love the overhead press but instead of doing that as my final exercise i might just do weighted push-ups because i feel it would give me more carryover you know and it doesn't have the downsides on your recovery like you said it works as serratus and the thing is too a lot of people on their bench they um they're locked in like they're not uh, they're not protracting at all. And even if you try to cue them to do that, they'll just refuse. So if you're going to use your traditional form, no matter what, then at least complement it with a variation that forces you to not do that. This way you have that movement variability that makes you resilient um, like all the way through. And even like, like don't just train your normal range of motion just because that's what you're always going to do in a comp, you know, get the deep work and all that but yeah we already covered that before oh man that's that's a good point to just retread back onto because as you said it just makes you more robust overall that's a good point that we did mention is that like if you're someone where i could tell you a million different cues i can tell you okay move your scaps while you bench you're not 
inhibited by the actual weight. It's just you're locked in too tight. You just let them move. Some people don't get that. But the push-up is just so intuitive to just fully protract and fully retract. And that's a movement that you can replace something like a bench variation with, where in the, they would be overworking that retracted state with a bench variation and hurting themselves potentially. Now they're getting... At, at worst, equivalent hypertrophy, equivalent strength carryover. And now they're more healthy as well because they're not overusing that retraction. Exactly. So it's like an easy compensation strategy, even though you're actually learning how to properly move. And I find that when you do variations like that, eventually your, your regular form on the bench is going to change. Like the stronger you get at a lot of these variations, your groove, it's different, you know? because you optimize your position. Like I found that when I, uh, when I maxed out on a bunch of different styles, I finally learned how to maneuver my elbows. Like back then I would always be super tucked in, pressing in a straight vertical line, like the geared powerlifter way, which isn't really um, ideal for raw benchers. The only thing that fixed that was pressing in different angles. And I realized you can't keep that position. You gotta flare a little bit, you know? So that's where the movements um, can actually refine your technique on the basics. Absolutely. So part of it, part of that, uh, that movement variability and just moving better with your elbows comes from having the knowledge to know that certain things should be happening on bench press. So your scaps should move a little bit and then just allowing your body to move naturally. Your body is going to move in a way that's going to prevent injury and let you move the most weight if you just let it. And then yep. once you're in that groove, then you can be cognizant of that groove. Because like you said, it'll change your form over time. That gear bench press style will turn into more of that natural arc that it should be. Yeah, I guess we just got to trust our bodies a little bit more. But at the same time, be aware of certain muscular weaknesses. Like if you know that something is wrong, uh, don't just keep hammering away that technique just because you can get away with it. Because maybe an injury is inevitable. Uh, if you keep doing that, like your natural mechanics are great, but try to optimize them as much as possible. Not that you're trying to force a position that isn't like the best, but at least like, you know, get everything as jacked as humanly possible so that, you know, it's not just you saying, yeah, this is my natural range of motion or whatever. Like we talked about before with the RDL. Yeah, it's, it's just all about being objective, knowing when you yeah. need to change. And, and if you don't need to change it, don't change it. You know? Keep things simple. Yeah, keep things simple. I know we're using a lot of uh, <laughs> big terms in this uh, talk, but I think we've explained it in a way that makes sense, you know? So I wanted to ask you about box squats. And the reason is that you, you ended up breaking your back on those, yeah? So what, what are your thoughts on box squats in 2022? Do you still do them? Would you program them for a client? And how did you recover from that back injury. That's a that's an interesting tale with a lot of ups and downs. I guess we'll talk about just my general thoughts on the box squat. I don't dislike the movement. I hurt myself because I didn't do it properly. It's okay. By saying, guys, there's no, there's almost no movement that is just inherently bad for you. Certainly not box squats. There's a story. There's a million stories of someone who injured themselves doing a movement, and then suddenly this is the movement that you that will kill your gains if you do it. Yeah, got to hold ourselves accountable, you know. And I appreciate you saying that too. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, in that regard, you know, that was a hit on me. I just, I, I you know, uh, you ever play Super Smash Brothers? Oh, of course. You know, Yoshi like his is a uh, his down B attack where he uh huh when he does the slam with his ass. <laughs> That's exactly what I fucking <laughs> bro. Um, and it wasn't even like a like a parallel box squat. It was just like a, an exercise that I really like is like a deadlift stance, high box squat for you know building leg drive with deadlift. That's what I, and that's what I was doing at the time was like a, a max effort variation. Uh, I, I might shoot you the video on Instagram. I think I have it on my old phone. It's just the funniest shit ever. It wasn't funny because I broke my back, but uh, bro. It's and, funny to talk about it. Man, but it's, it's so, the way you describe that, it's so vivid in my brain. Like, I can see that happening. You're just crashing. And how, how did it feel in that moment? Like, were you like, oh, f th this is it. Like, I snapped myself up. Or was it when you got up and you realized something wasn't quite right? It was 
like a, a not like a crunch sensation, but like you could just feel oh. it, hard to describe it, and it, and numbness that went mm. from my my butt to like my hamstring, eventually went down to my toes. Um, in terms of like the healing process, like after everything was you know in terms of the bones healing and everything like that. Luckily, I'm not like without use of my legs like like larson pressing like uh adrian larson because i literally had no choice yeah yeah but um it was and this is like something valuable that we can talk about actually with injuries a lot of the times you'll have pain that is not necessarily associated with you still being injured it's just this weird nerve yeah you know so i would have days where like the pain would be so debilitating where like i couldn't hip hinge the bar like anything that put any sort of shear or axial loading on my back or my hips you know anything in that you know pelvic area i couldn't do it there'd be days where i could lift a little bit of weight days where i could lift you know, maybe 405 or so eventually what i came to the conclusion was is that okay i'm not injured anymore but certain things are creating pain to the point where i can't work the muscles that i'm trying to work and Working these muscles is going to help me feel better faster. So I'm like, shit, what do I do? Back extensions. Back extensions are so good. Reverse hypers, if you have access to that. But I didn't have access to a reverse hyper, so I used mm -hmm. back extensions. They have zero axial loading. It's zero stress on your, you know, your spine in terms of the shear. And you can do them for a ton of volume. Uh, I was the back extension king. That's all I would do. That's all I could do for my right. uh, my lower back, my spinal erectors, my glutes, my hamstrings. And it's when I started to do that and those muscles, not only did they just recover from their atrophy, they started to get bigger and stronger. And, you know, at the back extension, I started to get less and less and less and less and less pain. To the point where I'm at now. So basically, instead of doing absolutely nothing and just praying that the pain goes away, you employed an active method where you're going to get these reps in, it's low stress on your recovery, just build up the muscles, build the tissue capacity. As slow as it might be, eventually you'll get to that point where now you're starting to move upwards, which is basically what happened. And it, it took some time. Yeah, Like how many months was this entire process of rehabilitating? Mm. Like a year. Like A year, eh? When I, um, my first upload on YouTube was about a year ago. I was like <laughs> six months into like the total, like overall recovery process. So like six months into my YouTube career of posting videos, I was doing things like back extensions and, and belt squats and things like that. Right. To do. So, I mean, it's just something that you have to be patient about. You can't yeah. push quickly, but you still want to work your body. Movement is medicine. Yeah. Movement is, that's the takeaway. Movement, movement is medicine. And a year is a long time. So I want people to understand that, you know, it's going to take the time that it takes. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And just to say, if, if you go on your channel, your back is strong, man. And no one would know that you had an injury like that. You can probably deadlift somewhere in the 600s right now. Uh, that's coming back after breaking your back. Like, it's not... <laughs> A mini strain in your spinal rectors so it just goes to show that the body is resilient and if you just are slow with the process but the gradual steps you know are healing then it's just a matter of time and you know it's never too late to start again and set prs and now you're, you're going for all time prs just to say and I, i've seen you put some you, you're doing back extensions with heavy weight on your back like with the barbell you know you're not doing with like a 25 pound plate or whatever mm -hmm. i got those from um uh, clock off right yeah. yeah dude he's he's such he's such a he's like a real life anime character but no i saw him do them on youtube and i'm like that looks really good because he's not using a whole lot of weight relative to what he did deadlift or rdl or good morning but it, he said Someone in, said in the comments, like he said in Russian, like after one set, my back is like an ass. Like it was that. <laughs> um, I started doing them and I really love those as like a, uh, not, not even just a finisher, just like to pump a lot of volume into your, 
uh, posterior chain. I'm doing them now instead of RDLs, unfortunately, just because I'm so lean. I can't recover from both yeah. squats and RDLs. Mm-hmm. But um, just even if you're someone that could recover from it, that's still a good option. It's like good. Squat, yeah. With back extension. Yeah. Like, no doubt when you get heavier, you're still going to do those. And, uh, like, I, I wish I could do that. You know, I don't have the setup over here in my home gym. Mm-hmm. But those... And even the 45 degree, but the 90 degree in particular, it just looks like a great way to get more out of less weight and develop all the muscles, the posterior chain. So it's like, what what are some of your favorite, because you talk about tiers, yeah? There's mm-hmm. tier one, tier two, tier three. So you, the conventional deadlift would be a tier one, I believe. Then a tier two would be an RDL. And then a good morning would be like a tier three. Mm-hmm. Or what are some tier three exercises besides like, the 90 degree back extension and the 45 degree that really raise your deadlift performance mm. or variations within those that you find are that most people can can do that's a fun one just because there's a whole lot that you can do with those tier three uh tier three variations that's where i say like tier one and tier two they're already spoken for but the tier three that's where you can really just start to do a lot of bodybuilding mechanics especially uh i really like dumbbell rdls just because you can get a gigantic range of motion on them. Like the diameter of any, like the diameter of the bulkiest, like broly sized dumbbell mm-hmm. is going to be less than even a 25 pound plate. That's true. So if you just say you get, you know, dumbbell RDLs, and you're using 150s and you're touching the floor each rep, that's like an extreme deficit RDL. It is really cool just because what you can do is you can turn them neutral to the side so that you're getting a little bit less lower back and a little bit more glutes and hamstrings. Mm-hmm. A cool gold tidbit for anybody watching. Yeah, it's like with trap bar RDLs, pretty similar for that. Just you get more range of motion and you could, you know, move the dumbbells a little bit more freely. So it's exactly. easier on the joints. Anyone with adjustable dumbbells, let's just say worst case scenario, all you have adjustable dumbbells or type or even like a ghetto like went to home depot and got some pieces of pipe yeah yeah you could put some 25s on and just rep out you know 125s on each arm just as something at the end of your workout you i've never used anything more than a buck 50s for that exercise for like sets of 10 so you still it's one of those exercises where you don't need as much weight as you think you do to get a good stimulus okay now, another deviation of that is if that's too easy, you can elevate your toes on plates and that pre-stretches your hamstring. So it's like more hamstring dominant. Um, another variation could be a single leg dumbbell RDL. Like there's just variations of the dumbbell RDL are good for like that, that tier three movement. Okay. Now, if you don't have access to dumbbells, that's a little that's a little trickier. I would say in that case, you really could just do good morning variations. Um, sh- straight leg, good mornings, good mornings off of pins are really good if you want to beef up your, your lower back. But with a good morning, you got to be careful not to do the squat morning. And some of it is going to be limited. Like I saw your video on RDLs versus good mornings. And a really good point that you brought up was that when you get past your body weight, by say 10 pounds or so, just the leverages are going to be different. So really, you're not doing a proper hip hinge at that point. So there's a cap to what you could do. And therefore, you have to compensate with harder variations or just higher volume. But I think what's also uh, interesting in that topic is that might be enough weight for some people, like depending on their experience level and Mm -hmm. when they do the good mornings. Like if it's uh, at the end of the program, and they weigh like 200 pounds, well, that's still some pretty heavy weight, especially if they're doing it with the SSB and the cam, and it's like upside down. So now you're getting more upper back in there too. We can always get creative, even if an exercise has its limitations. Absolutely. It's good to know those limitations, but it's also good to just have some ingenuity. Like if you don't have yeah. access to anything else, okay, how can I modify this to make it hard? It's just mm-hmm. at lower tempo. That putting it later in a program will, will, because there's a difference between, we can talk just as an aside really quickly. 
if you, for example, have your overhead press, and this is just, you know, general programming, you have it at the end of your program, for example, or a good morning, and you did deadlifts and then some RDLs, and then you're finishing with good mornings, if you can do something like that. Let's just say you kept the good morning weight the same throughout the course of four weeks, but you increased in everything else. That's still indicative of you getting stronger at good mornings because you did the same weight in a more fatigued state for the same right. time or more. Yeah, that's a good point. It's like a form of auto-regulation. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that's another thing, right? People will say, well, I got bigger, but my numbers didn't improve that much. I have to ask, really? Are you, are you sure about that? Because if you're lifting the same loads in a fatigue state and your reps in reserve is no longer like zero or one, maybe it's like four, like that's progression. So I think we need to look at like performance increase in a more general context. It's not just about the weight on the bar. Absolutely. It's how quickly you move it, how hard it is to move a given weight, how much volume you can do with it. That's a good, you know, just a good way to talk about step loading again. It's you're using the same weight for three weeks, but you're increasing tonnage on it. Like that, if you can go, you certainly probably couldn't do five sets of whatever you're doing at the first week. Mm-hmm. But over time, you come to be able to do five sets at the same weight. They're thinking, oh, I'm not putting any weight on the board. That's a very, like, uh, I guess, Western periodization way of looking at it. Like, more, more, more is the mm-hmm. only way stronger and that's not the case especially not when you're stronger that's true uh, i want to ask you about rep ranges right do you have ranges when you do your programming like three sets of six to ten or was it more static then you base the rest off reps in reserve and you just you change that as the weeks pass by like where do you see the topic of evolving rep ranges with the berserk method it's, it's good because that's a nice Easter egg with the Berserk method. I do I did actually incorporate uh, natural hypertrophies evolving rep ranges. Somewhere. Okay. I think it's with the squats somewhere. I think it's it's really good for movements where they're always just going to be like objectively hard or they'll feel heavy, but you can all you always got a little bit more juice to to push another rep into it week after week. So things like squats, I like to use evolving rep ranges. Uh, uh, Steve Shaw calls it the the rep goal. Yeah, so movements like that are really like using that for. But in terms of like static rep ranges on the Berserk method, I do like having like a set rep range, so like 12s for example, and then just increasing that top set or just doing more RP on the back downs maybe. It just depends on the movement. Okay. And uh, when you do uh, back downs, uh, if, if you overshot a given weight, what would you lower it by? Like eight to twelve percent, somewhere around there. Yeah, so that's actually something good. So lowering those back downs if you do overshoot, just to not make it too complicated. The the goal with RPE is just to ensure an average intensity. Exactly. You can ask the, the you know the guy that came up with it. If you overshoot and say where you were prescribed to do RPE six and you do RPE nine. All you have to do is just lower your exertion on those back down sets, and then it'll still average out to be about the same as what it should be. So it doesn't really matter what's on the bar per se. It's just the proximity to failure as a whole. Like if you're getting the prescribed RPE, you're good. It doesn't matter if you had to drop 10 pounds. And overall, you're going to get less fatigue if you do it this way instead of like overshooting and then you get buried to the ground in your first few weeks. You know, then you complain that it doesn't work. Exactly. And when, when you combine that overshooting with like big barbell movements, that's when people start to say, well, I've been stuck at a 250 bench press for. Yeah, I, I think it goes back to what you said before regarding the Western model of just wanting more all the time. Like that leads to more plateaus. I, I find that when you really take your time, you basically never get plateaus. As strong of a statement that might be. In my experience, I found it to be mostly true. You just, like, I can't think of any plateaus from last year because I took a slower approach, you know? You, you said it, man. Like, it, it, it sounds like, because neither one of us believe in the natural limit. So, like, it's going to sound biased coming from us. But try it for yourself. If you just take your time 
guys with your progression and you just take PRs when they're there and not when you want them to be there, you said, okay, after four weeks, I'm going to increase by five pounds. You're not guaranteed to get the five pounds, but more than likely, since you took your time with everything else, you're going to get the five pounds, maybe get more than yeah. five pounds, you know, so. And, and sometimes you'll, yeah, you'll increase even more than you originally thought. So you were planning on taking it slow, but then you go in and you're like, holy fuck, I'm feeling pretty good. Like, wow. So that's where just trusting the process is so key. Don't, don't even worry about the end result. Just do the appropriate work. If everything is right, you know you're going to get gains. And that's where this whole thing about the natural limit comes back. Have standards for yourself, you know, but don't, don't be married to them to the point where you go crazy and you think about it 24 seven, like start with one goal at a time, you know, like, uh, instead of shooting for a 500 bench, try getting 420 first. a little, like the PRs they'll add up. Cause if, if you try to put too much on your plate, well, that leads to rushing progression and then getting injured. So the right mentality, it, it needs to be synced with your programming. Absolutely. That that mentality of just taking small bites. Because if you look at it as like, talk about food, just, just say you have to eat an entire pizza, gun to your head, or you can't leave the room, okay? Yeah. You look at it as, okay, damn, I got to eat this whole pizza. Well, no, you're going to eat this piece, and then that piece, and then that piece, and then, and then it's gone. Yeah. So you're someone that eventually wants to bench press 500 pounds one day. I know a bunch of naturals that can do that. Mm-hmm. I have to look at it as, okay, I benched 225 now, 250, 70, 300, 330, so on and so forth. So small, not small, because that's what people, oh, 30 pounds on my bench is nothing. I'm nowhere near. No, uh, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot, dude. Give me <laughs> pounds on my bench press right now, please. Like any one of my lists, please. I would right. gladly. Even, even 10 pounds in a, in a year after a certain point, I wouldn't call that bad progress if you're like a really elite lifter like just to say let's say i don't know you're 30 years old benching 400 pounds and you train for the next 10 years you're 40 now you added 10 pounds every year well now you're a 500 pound bencher and you're freaking 40s how badass is that and you're not going to lose the strength people don't understand you can get the only natural limit is like when you pass away so like you can continue to get gains until like you're much older than you think you are, and then you can still progress in other ways. You don't stop progressing at 30. It's not just a downslope from 30. I train plenty of people who are 30, 40, 50 years old that continue to make gains, and they make them slowly, but your progress should be looked at as incremental and gradual anyway. You got guys who never picked up a weight in their life, and now they're starting in their 50s, and they're gaining a bunch of strength, and they're not on TRT. So if they're able to do it then, like, why would it be problematic if you're 25 training till 50 and now you have all the strength built up? Like, why would you all of a sudden stop? You know, I know people talk about the T levels, but you really need maximum to start strong to make gains. You probably don't, you know, it, like you, you got women who are putting up serious numbers as naturals and they got like quality. So it goes beyond just your hormonal profile. Surely that helps with recovery, but there's a lot of other factors that go into this. And if that means you got to cut things back, so be it. But I don't believe that you just stop making progress completely. You never stop making progress. And certainly your T levels are an indicator really of the progress that you can make. Because to your point, there are women with like even a, an enhanced woman that is like taking Anavar or whatever. Their testosterone levels are still lower than like the lowest of the low man. And they're make you see women out here that um, uh, Joe, Joe Sullivan's uh, wife, I, I forget what her name is, but she deadlifts like 600 pounds sumo. She's on, she's on PEDs, but like her hormonal profile is still lower than your, your arms. That's to say that like we, we can segue into like PEDs and things like that and our opinions on them soon, but that's just to say that like you don't have to boost your hormone levels or even really worry about them as much as you worry about eating well, sleeping enough, training well. You're going to get whatever you're going to get doing that. Yeah, at the end of the day, that's what matters most, right? Like you can have naturally, first of all, let's establish this, right? If you have natural high T, it's still not super physiological. So 
it does come back to nutrition and sleep at the end of the day. They just fantasize about getting on a cycle when in reality they haven't addressed the, the fundamental causes behind their plateaus, which is horrific programming. Like it's such garbage that that's why they're not making gains. And the training is everything. I, I don't think people understand. Like if you're not getting coached by someone who knows what they're talking about or you don't understand it yourself, your results aren't going to be the best, even if your effort is there. It's, it's when you have these conversations with people who don't agree with that, because not every, there are going to be people that are watching this. They're going to say, what are you talking about? There's a natural limit. I'm trying hard. I'm not getting gains. People take you saying that effort isn't enough as to discredit the effort that they're putting in. I recognize that a lot of people work hard to even just get lean, not even get strong, and they don't do it. If you work hard at doing the wrong things, it's like trying to dig a hole with a, with a plastic spoon. I don't care how hard you try to do it, you're not going to be able to do exactly. it. Exactly. you got to have the right tools, and the right tools are programming. This is why I dissuade most people from taking PEDs. It's why I do not take PEDs myself. I, there's, there's an entire discussion that can go on with, it, with that, but... I think Dave Tate is the one that said it. He wouldn't train anybody unless they knew how to break plateaus without the use of drugs. Because the reality of the situation is, unless you just continue to take more and more and more and more drugs, you're still going to have to know how to train to make progress. That's not to say steroids don't do anything. They tremendously raise your baseline. They make you way more jacked. But you still need to be able to know how to train. And that's why I tell these guys, like, you... Stop looking for reasons to take TRT. You more than likely don't have low T levels. If you do, it's not going to manifest in your, your bench press that's not going up. It's going to be in your sex drive, your mood, the suicidal thoughts that you have. The average person that wants to get on PEDs does not need to be on them. They don't, unless you're someone that's competitive in a sport where you're making money or you can be the strongest guy in the world. Yeah, in that case, it's fair game because everybody's on it and they're all genetic freaks. But I think the distinction is if you're a recreational drug user, that's those are the guys that get on my nerves because they'll display, you know, some of them will display similar performance to some elite naturals, but they don't know how the f they got there and they can't coach anybody to save their life. So it really is the drugs in their case. But now what they could have done naturally and they're now at that stage they won't progress that much more. It's exactly like if a jabroni that knew nothing about programming had a plateau, all they would be is they're still mentally that same novice. Yeah. Lifter, but they're just bigger and stronger. They still are not going to be happy with themselves because they're still at a plateau. They're taking all these drugs. They've progressively taken more and more and more and more in different kinds. They, you know, increase from the drugs that they're taking. They take a little bit more, they increase, but... They've gotten to the point where their doctor is like, hey, I don't know what the fuck you're doing, but whatever hormones that you're giving yourself, we have to dial that back. And then they start to get smaller and then they stop making progress and then they start to regress and then they're not happy with themselves. If you're someone that is of the mindset of I need to make progress, this is why I give so much information away for free. Right. It's to dissuade people from thinking that they're limited in anything. The problem with naturals, in my opinion is that we can't dream anymore. We're always told that you're limited by this. You can't mm -hmm. put, put so much muscle on in a year. You can't do this. You can't do that. Naturals need to know that the sky is the limit. I guarantee you that in the, the, you know, in the age of before steroids, where people were just huge, jacked, that they weren't worrying about, I'm, I'm limited by how much protein I can get. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't have access to a barbell. I can't get jacked. They made it happen. Yeah. And it was a different generation too. People who went through war and actually struggled on a level that most of us will probably never understand. But just to say they weren't, a lot of these naturals peaked later in life when that's supposedly not supposed to happen. And I believe that we need to learn from these old school greats. When I read their books and I look at the feats of strength, I'm like, wow. A lot of guys are having extreme difficulties replicating that. And it, it's it's probably because of their mentality. They're just not giving it the proper time that it, it needs, you know? And um, us dreaming again is key. Having a community of naturals who are 
showing you what's possible, that's awesome. And I, we all learn from each other. We all have a different way of training, but we can borrow ideas and we just uplift one another. And just to say, like, I have better leverages than you on the bench press. I would Without say you're – right? <laughs> no. <laughs> and you're – I would say you're, you're probably stronger than me on that. Even in an unpeaked state, you've surpassed me. You know, what is that? That's not genetics. There's something interesting that we can talk about on that topic, actually. So we'll, we'll talk about like actual high level athletes that train every day of their life. I was actually talking to a buddy of mine about this. It's that if you take like the elite of the elite power lifters, for example, they're for the most part, not so much different from the rest of us. If you took a true freak, like Saquon Barkley, for example, he's an American football player. He's done like insane, like 450 pound power cleans, 600, 700 pound squats. His strength and conditioning program is awful. And he only started training from when he was 18 on. These people mm. that train their entire lives correctly as elite power lifters, they're not really as elite as you think they are. It's true. Like doing the right things consistently over time. Whereas a lot of people, recreational lifters, they just don't because they don't have access to the knowledge. You're right. So it's like just how people talk about um, those guys who get on juice early on and they have a great physique, like within a two to five year time frame. The same applies to those genetic freaks. They, they might excel like right off the bat, but everyone else, look at their freaking age. They're not 21-year-old powerlifters. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's proof, or well, at least good evidence, that they're not freaks in the way that most people suggest they are. And so it really is a, a long-term grind. People need to get out of this get-results-quick mentality. It's not going to happen for most. And you would know right away if you were a freak. Those are the guys that are like 16, 17. A year after, they're already putting up advanced or elite numbers. You freaking know. Everybody else, which is what we seem to see in a lot of uh, natty powerlifters, it wasn't that. So that, that should also be motivating, you know? Exactly. And it's, it's motivating if you're, you have the willingness to be able to look at that and see that it's not the genetics that dictates my results necessarily. Because we're all capable of extraordinary feats of strength over time eventually at some point we're all equally capable of to be honest with you we're all capable of reaching a 405 bench as a natty as a lifetime goal some people may not surpass that but everybody can reach that it's my opinion um but people take these incredible feats of strength and because they're so far away from where they're at now it becomes impossible now it becomes yeah bad. there's no other well, way you know what made me believe it was possible? A four or five bench. A lot of old school bodybuilders did it. And they weren't even strength athletes. And this was in a time where steroids didn't even exist. And they probably didn't have the same understanding that we have about, like, how to optimize things. Like, I guarantee you they weren't doing Larson presses. Or in general, they, they weren't doing the shit that many powerlifters promote today, which is deemed as optimal. Uh, a lot of it was just general hypertrophy training and they ate a lot of food and they gave it time and they, they benched four plates and they had normal leverages in most cases, not even doing a super arch bench, just to say, we saw 400 pound benches, 700 pound deadlifts. This was not considered like it was the best for the time, you could say, like on an average scale across these elites, but it wasn't peak performance, you know, like we can, we can go beyond that. We weren't in the information age and, uh, that should be the baseline for setting a high standard. And I believe it myself now. Like I can, I can get the 200 kilo bench, probably even go beyond. Like why, why not 500? If you think about it logically, why not? If you're going to train for the next 20 years and we're not going to get injured because we're just getting smarter with our programming, who knows what's possible? And I think that's one of your goals. Yeah, you want to bench 500 pounds at 50 years old. Hell yeah. And you know why? It's because I have a good buddy of mine who's natural. The bench is more than that. Mm. It is. He has leverages similar to your own. So that's why I absolutely think that, for example, yeah, hell yeah, you can bench 200 kilos. More than that. You know, I absolutely believe in you because I've, I've seen it done. 
by people who are just as genetically blessed or not blessed as each and every one of us for the most part. It's the word average for a reason. The average person does not have shitty genetics. That's not how it, it works. Can't, it can't happen. It yeah. wouldn't be average. <laughs> exactly. And I don't think we're genetic freaks, man. We're not. I, I really, I don't think that. Maybe, maybe we can say we're, the, the problem is we don't even know what above average is at this point. In, in the sense that maybe average people are just doing things so bad because the average understanding isn't good, that that's what it is. But maybe we did things a little bit better than most people, and therefore we're above average. I don't know. That's a great point. That average understanding being so low is a result of just the overall quality of information that we have in our genre and the quality of influencers that we have in our genre. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to do with steroids because no person that's on steroids that gives out bad information really is telling people to take steroids. They're doing things in a way that they didn't do that to get their bodies. They either took drugs or they're doing something else entirely with their training to get big in addition to their drugs. But if they're telling you that you can just say, for example, do 10 by 10 dumbbell curls and you'll get a jacked upper body or whatever nonsense that these influencers will put out, or you can bias the muscle fibers and eat vegan and eat only meat or do whatever pokey pokey stuff they're talking about and you don't get those results, you've now convinced yourself that you're genetically below average. Because if this mm -hmm. is just some average guy that can do it, he just made a YouTube channel and I can't do it, I must be below average. Below average knowledge is put out by someone that absolutely knows people will look up to them. They have something that people want. They have either good looks, money, fame, a good body, or a combination of all those things. Mm -hmm. And then they see that and they take advantage of it. So the problem isn't necessarily steroids, but the people who are using them are using steroids. Okay. People are doing all this stuff are using steroids. So that's not to say that I think that every PED user is bad or immoral. It's not the John Meadows that are manipulating people. It's right. Not, you know, the people who took steroids and were open about it and were good people. They gave good information. God rest his soul. It's the people who manipulate people. And we have to isolate them. Yes. From everybody else, we have yeah. to make that everybody. We have to make a distinction. Yeah, that they're full of crap, basically. Yeah, it's the manipulators versus the honest ones that actually put out good information. Like, um, I would, I would say, I don't follow many steroid users because I just, I don't respect what that lifestyle is about, and the information tends to not be the best. However, there are some people whose word I put above some naturals and they're enhanced because I, I look at their information objectively and they know what they're talking about and whether they were enhanced or not there's zero doubt in my mind that they would have an elite physique for strength and size and i look up to those people and i you know i enjoy watching their videos i would buy products from them absolutely you know so it's not so black and white that because someone is enhanced they must not know anything but we can look at averages i think that's the thing you know that's fair the average pd user on this platform is more than likely lying to you about something whether it's the fact that they're using them in the first place which to me is like like the the most beta thing that you can do just because we've talked about if you're taking like you're honest to god taking low dose drugs and you're just you know whatever and you're not taking more and more you still need to know how to train. So you should have enough confidence in the information that you can give to people. That even if you did take steroids, you can be honest about it because you still have to train hard on a low dose of drugs. You're not someone that's blasting gear. That to me is just like something, if you're a fake natty, I guess is what I'm saying, I have no respect for you. I make memes about people like that. Yeah. You know, so. And it really just is isolating those people who know what they're talking about, irrespective of drugs, and making it more about not necessarily the fact that they take drugs or how they look, but the quality of information that they're putting out. But that's just so hard to cognitively separate the two because, you know, we're in a sphere where, you know, 
part of people's opinion on us is based upon how strong we are, how we look. Stronger looks, yeah. That that's that's the problem with this, with this industry. The guy who looks the best or is just blessed at certain things will appear to be more knowledgeable. When many times that's the furthest thing from the truth. Like, uh, you know, we're not uh, the biggest naturals. We have great physiques. We're strong. There are pe- but there are people who are above us on that. But maybe they don't have the same knowledge for certain things. Maybe they can't convey that to their audience. Like, or, or if they understand it for themselves, they can't teach it. Don't just follow someone only because of what you're looking at. When they speak, you'll get a, you'll know if they're the real deal or not. Like when I came across your channel, I was very impressed because, like upon first glance, you see you're putting up these amazing feats of strength. You got the body right. You even got your your funny videos. You're like Natty, uh, more place, more dates. You're showing off, right? Yeah. <laughs> and it's like this guy has a sick physique. Is he a meathead though? But then you click on the videos. And you're able to form proper sentences. You got your whiteboard in the background. You're able to explain all the nuances and you're extremely articulate. You're not just trying to sound good. Everything makes sense. You can give actual reasons. Then you put two and two together. Okay, he has this body because of the information and the work ethic and everything that he preaches. And so they go both, they go hand in hand. You know, the personality of the person, what they're bringing you and how that ultimately manifests in the final outcome and also the fact that you like anime says a lot about you too you even got the tattoos you know and the whole theme of, of struggling to grow like that says a lot about people who believe in the natural limit uh versus not that's all high praise man i appreciate that but it's all very true you can look at certain qualities and you know the influences that you're looking at are they focused on information are they focused on giving value? Are they, you know, is the information they give sound? Are they articulate? They have a good personality. Are they personable? Those are all things that people should be looking at, not instead of the way they look, but in addition to. So yeah. if they have that good body and, you know, they're strong, but they're deficient in all those other areas, maybe it's just someone you watch for fun. Maybe it's not someone you give your money to. Maybe it's not someone you take advice from if they're giving advice away for free. Maybe if that person was on steroids and they had the physique and the strength and they don't have all those other things, it doesn't matter how they look because you're looking at all these other factors that contribute to someone who's worthy of taking advice from. It's not having a parasocial relationship really for any reason, but certainly not because of the way someone looks. You know, like there's some people who are really strong naturals. And I respect them, but I would never buy a program from them or like take them seriously for advice. Like it's like you said, entertainment. You, it's cool to see, you know, and maybe you can use that as possible inspiration to try to beat their numbers or whatever. But at the end of the day, you got to look at everything that goes beyond that point. Like to me, programming is number one and then everything else is just bonus. But of course, you got to walk the walk, right? Some guys, they just talk. It's a lot of theory, but they got zero results. And in that case, I have a hard time trusting them. So if you have this vast understanding, there should be some reflection in your physique. Not that you're the best of the best, but you should at least be a little bit above average and, and, and have the standards that you talked about before. Like if a guy's one or max deadlift is 315 and he's telling you all the reasons why this is the best program you can run or, or it's science-based, like f- me, man, it's, it's, I find it's hard when we get to those extremes, you know, so there's gotta be somewhat of a balance, somewhat of a balance. And that's what, that's what makes like eradicating our current meta tricky because there's nuance and you have to be someone that can think. Yeah. Nuances. And you have to be able to just take information, not only at face value, but every which way it can go. Yeah. You, you need to look, would care about the way your influencer looks, but that shouldn't be the only thing. So, but that is to your point, if they look like shit, you know, you're not going to listen to them at all. So that's the, that's the delicate balance we have. That's why it takes people like you, people like natural hypertrophy, people who are big, strong, whatever, 
that also give out good information. Those are the people that are going to, in my opinion, have the most influence. To continue to change things from the, the era of bigger, better, faster to, okay, there's substance with that as well. And that's something that you have to care about as well. Yeah. Or you just have to be so freaking smart and have this amazing video quality that's like next level that, okay, maybe you're not as jacked as us, but you're offering something. But I find those people are rare, to be perfectly honest with you. you it takes a lot of work, man. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I wanted to ask you about anime inspiration and uh, how that's impacted you as a serious lifter. So uh, you obviously got some tats on you. You got Yu Yu Hakusho. You got a Dragon Ball Z one. You got the Berserk on your back also. What what does that signify? You know, and besides like... You know, just the lifting. That's an excellent question. So what those signify outside of just lifting? Anime, for me, and just fictional stories in general, they were always something that I held close to my heart, kind of in the same way that, like, other people may look at, you know, movie stars and, you know, things like that. They were always examples of how to carry yourself in such a way. So... Uh, I'm one of those weirdos where, like, my favorite character in Dragon Ball Z wasn't Goku, it was Vegeta. Uh, Me too. <laughs> I like that uh, that that gruff exterior, but also, you know, the, the, the honorableness and the, the noble pride, but also being able to be hard and stern as well. I always really looked up to that. I always liked in Yu Yu Hakusho how Yusuke was, like, honestly an asshole, but he was a, a good person. He was a, an, an excellent example of how to treat people at the end of the day, but he could be a jerk to the right kind of people in the right Yeah. Time. Anime for me, like I said, was just always growing up an example. I think natural hypertrophy called it the male power fantasy. Right. Example of like a higher version of yourself to try to be like, or to find aspects within yourself that you can work on. For me, I'm that person where I, I am the, the Vegeta type of person. I'm a, a harder exterior but I'm also fair, you know, uh, I, I take from the, the guts state of mind where, yeah, there's a hard exterior, but there's someone that really cares about people. They really wants to help people and help those that are close to them and struggle and just always be a badass. That's why I get these tattoos on me, man. Like I got Vegeta, I got Yusuke from Yu Yu Hakusho, I got Gohan from the Cell Games, I got... Mm -hmm. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, the Joe Star birthmark on my neck. I got the Brand of Sacrifice on the other side. Yeah. I got the Vegeta, Planet Vegeta crest right here. Like, these things are important to me. So, I think that people who watch anime and really just watch it for things deeper than like the entertainment value and really think on the, like the honestly, the life stories and the parables that they present to us and they have been presenting to us since we were young those types of people are the individuals that just generally are just more well-rounded they're kinder to people they 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 have higher willpower because they they see it like if you see uh gohan with one arm struggling against cell yeah you know you're you're not someone that's going to give up easily if you take the message of that to heart so that you don't give up yeah especially since a lot of people didn't have like masculine role models early on in their life and or a lot of friends they they turn to the anime and it, and it shows them a lot of life lessons and they kind of develop their own parasocial relationship with the characters and they look up to them and want to be like that so instead of idolizing say arnold you idolize a vegeta or goku and you look at the struggles that they go through and you want to look like them Instead of looking like a, an actual real life person, and even some of the feats of strength, which are actually impossible, <laughs> you know, you're like, I want to do that too. I want to move a, a big boulder or whatever. And it's just the brainwashing at a young age, and we're very impressionable, right? I find it, it sticks with you for the rest of your life, you know, and, and you remember those moments when you think about those animes, and even when you rewatch them as an adult, it hits different. And some of the messages really are for a, a more mature audience when you really break it down. Absolutely. Just an example, my favorite manga or just anime Japanese type of uh, literature is Berserk. I've read that at multiple 
points in my life. Like I read it as a teenager, like all the way through up to like wherever it was serialized. And I read it when I was like 20 and then I've reread it uh, somewhat recently. I've gotten a different experience from it each time I read it because as I gained life experience, I started picking up on more themes and intricacies mm-hmm. that I can relate to. Yeah. So it's like experience each time and dude that that's like the quintessential story that like even the people who don't like anime or manga i put them on the berserk for example and it's just such a story about humanity and struggle that's universally relatable to anybody it's uh it's the biggest theme if you ask me and and we all have our own demons that we got to fight every single day and and guts is just a, a metaphor for that and we, most of us can relate to him on some aspect, you know, like he's been through a lot of traumas and you can see how his character progresses, you know, I'm not, I don't want to spoil anything, but losing everything. And then, you know, ha- setting up a new party later on, like there's a lot to take in. And when you look at the author, you know, it, it, it makes you get into his mind a little bit as well, you know, and, and understand that a lot of these people, like even the fucking show spongebob bro it was written by a marine biologist like these are intelligent people and there's a lot of information being shared when you actually look beyond the entertainment aspect of yeah there's this guy with a big ass sword killing everybody like the same about that yeah it's just so much more of a um like you said an avatar for us to be able to put ourselves into that's why so many people have a parasocial relationship with guts because it's like so easy (laughs) <laughs> that's me i did that once or i was in a situation like this and it's not anything funny it's like legitimately like we all can relate no. basically yeah and I, and I really do believe that it uh it sets a higher physical standard we've seen it too many times so um i want to go back to some lifting stuff uh we can start wrapping up soon but i had some other questions that i was going to ask you we went over really good special exercises for getting more out of less weight and just generally making you more well-rounded what's some of the opposite of that basically overrated exercises that you often see prescribed that in your experience don't really seem to do that much or there's better alternatives Mm, that's a good question just because i'm i'm more of someone that doesn't necessarily think in terms of specificity so that it's almost hard to find an overrated one we can talk about specific applications and what they're overrated for. Now, if we're talking like most people watching this care about squat bench or deadlift, um, for raising your bench press, I would say that an overrated exercise for that could be something like it's hard to find one that's overrated for bench press just because it, your bench press bit pre- pretty much correlates to how like jacked you are in your upper body and anything that makes your upper body more jacked. Uh, is going to increase your bench press. I think it would just be focusing on what's not your weak point uh, in the bench press can be overrated. So if your lockouts are really smooth and you're hammering your triceps, you need to work on your chest. Now, in terms of deadlifts, in terms of increasing your deadlift, an overrated exercise for that, in my opinion, is hip thrusts, glute bridges, things like that. Just because I've seen women hip thrust like 600 pounds and then their deadlift is like 300 pounds and it's not because they're in good form on the hip thrust it's just because it's so non-specific to a deadlift you think okay it's increasing my my glute strength and whatnot and that'll help my lockout you you can't really isolate like the, the lockout of a deadlift with a movement like that and expect for it to have carryover because with a deadlift it's a pull it off the floor, you pull with your hamstrings, and then there's the lockout. If you're not strengthening everything else as well, it doesn't matter how smooth your lockout could be if you can't get it off the ground or if you can't, your hamstrings and back can't move it. That's one that I see a lot of people do, you know, which isn't bad just for movement variability if you want to work your glutes and get some local, you know, a pump to help with any tendon pain or anything like that. But in terms of strength training for a deadlift, overrated in my opinion. Um, for overhead press, for raising that, this is a conclusion that I've reached myself somewhat recently because I'm training the overhead press myself. I'm trying to get 
250 OHP, baby, please. Uh, mm -hmm. A back supported seated overhead press is nowhere near as good as just a Z press or sitting on something and not having your back supported. Like with a, a seated overhead press, you kind of start to turn it into like a bench press. Yeah. Almost naturally and it's it's super hard to just keep your back glued to the bench and not move it at all it's like everybody so, does it i find yeah man like it's it's so hard like i see people that put up impressive back supported overhead presses but it's like it's not an overhead press it's an incline yeah some people can't even <laughs> so they might be able to rep two plates on the back supported version but they can't even do it for one without which just proves right there that it's an incline press. It's not an OHP, so don't call it that. Which is not worthless necessarily, but the best carryover to overhead press is always going to be an overhead press. So to your point, they could throw up 225 for 10 reps seated, seated overhead press, and then maybe do it for one standing. So. Yeah. And then they'll do uh, partials at the same time. Yeah. They'll, they'll, do, the, they'll do this form like that. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I like to see it because I like to see people train hard. I just hate to see people do it and expect to get a good result from it, basically. Basically, yeah. Um, another overrated one for overhead press could be... Um, strangely enough, for raising your strict press, I think people overrate like push presses and push jerks enough just because... If you miss lockout with overhead press, it's something that I think you should address with like a banded overhead press. I agree, yeah. Where you change the strength curve, but not necessarily where you're eliminating the bottom portion with like leg drive, because it's it's not gonna have, your problem is brute strength. You don't need to just train your lockout. You need to train the bottom portion and then overload your lockout while still training that bottom portion. And a push press doesn't do that. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people that can throw up some crazy push press numbers. But their strict press uh, is not even two plates. So in my experience and from what I've seen anecdotally, there's better ways to build your lockout strength, like you just said. And the best one that I ever found was the overhead press with chains, even more so than the banded version. Because um, it doesn't, I find it's a more natural movement pattern, right? Because with the bands, it kind of turns into a, like a Smith machine overhead press, where it's a little bit more vertical because it's locking you in. But the chains are going to move with the sleeves, right? And the way it accommodates the strength curve is a bit different too, because uh, it's not actively pulling you down the entire time. And it's, it's different when you stabilize it over your head. So that, that was the best one I've ever done, you know? Even better than, uh, like at this point, I wouldn't even do partial overhead presses, like off pins and stuff like that. I would just do it with accommodating resistance and be done with it, or pause reps with a close grip, you know? That's another overrated one, I think, like the partial uh, pin presses were over. Yeah. Press. <laughs> That's pretty cool though, man. I've never, um, I've never thought about, you know, the superiority of the chains over the bands, but that does make sense. It's Appreciate really good. It. Try it out. I think you'll like it. You just got to set it up, like get a, get yourself like a daisy chain. This way you can get the right height. Cause mm -hmm. it's going to be different cause you're, you're standing up. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you're going to be very impressed with the way that feels. You see that on my Instagram is because we just talked about it now. Hell yeah. Oh yeah. It's an exchange of information, guys. That's what this is all about. It's about naturals coming together in a community. Nobody knows everything. And we exchange information to make each other better, uplift one another. So this is really good. It's a good example of what everybody should strive for. Absolutely, man. So j just to say, like I said at the very start of this uh, discussion, you've called out a lot of things in my comment section. Like accurately, you know, things that I wasn't even aware of, but you pointed it out and I was like, he's right. And then you started your own channel. Just like you, you've been training all these years. You, you're always there, but you weren't sharing the information. But now you are. And like just to say, I, I checked out your work and I've already learned so much. And we're going back and forth right now. We're just bouncing back certain ideas. This is all benefits for the community. <laughs> like it's serious you don't realize it that there's a random person out there who's doing good who's natural and they just got to make a channel come out and everyone is uplifted as a result it's really a an awesome thing to see and i like the the, the meme picture you posted with the jojo bizarre uh, adventures with uh, <laughs> the different 
natties, you know, paste it. Yeah. That's Those hilarious, are, man. Good mate, because that's more like the uh, like the, the shit poster side of me, like the. Korean, <laughs> right? It's good, and even the memes in general with uh, the steroid apologists and uh, all that stuff. They're they're funny, like you, how you mix in the anime and the lifting. We can even talk about that a little bit if you want to, because like the memes are just like funny, but they're always met there. But there is truth to that, there you is, know. There is truth. Yeah, to yeah. That. Piece of my opinion that comes with it. Mm hmm. So, what, what's some of, uh, what's a meme that you'll, you'll post just for, like, for, for fun, but it's actually like you're poking at a certain ideology? Mm, that's always what they're about. That's, <laughs> that's the problem, right? <laughs> so, um, I guess the one I posted most recently was in reference to the idea that natural lifters aren't better than TD enhanced lifters just because they're natural and they get strong. And it was like from JoJo where he's like, yes, I am. Yes, I am. Yeah. So that was to say that, okay, you're not necessarily a better person, but if you acquire an equal level of size and strength to someone that uses PEDs, you took the better road in my opinion. That's okay. That's if you're like, like taking testosterone because there's something wrong with you, like brain chemistry wise. I'm talking about like a recreational user that's just using it just because they can. Exactly. You should have pride in the fact that you're putting up numbers that some people can't, like you're putting up numbers on bench press naturally that people cannot deadlift. Yeah, I love it, man. Um, like even when people come after you in the comment section and you're like, uh, well, I... I bench more than you deadlift, bro. Or better yet, your squat. <laughs> that's my that's my go-to. That are like post physique. I, I, I'm real inundated yeah. at natural culture that we've created. Like that's just something that you say in the natural community. It's like, okay, bro, it's a funny joke. What's your bench press? You yeah. Know? To be able that's... to have that answer, in my opinion, is part of the community. You know. Yeah, and, and we got to build our confidence back up, you know? We got to get so strong and jacked that it's like we're not trying to put others down, but like we're proud of our achievements, you know, more proud than a steroid user who couldn't even get there. Like, to me, if you're on drugs and you're benching between 315 and 350, that is nice. absolute garbage. Like, embarrassing. Don't even call yourself an influencer. You have no right to give bench advice, in my opinion. I'm not going to say any names, but there are a lot of people that it's just a perennial truth that there are people that take steroids that put up natural numbers or below natural standards. Oh, it happens a lot, man. Actually, most of the fake natties are weaker than you and I on the bench. They might yeah. look better, but their performance is, is not there. And the thing is, if they train properly, they would surpass us easily. That's the craziest part. Yeah, like they're either bigger, they so therefore they should have more strength potential, you think, but they just don't know how to train. It's nuts, man. I'm absolutely someone that believes in what I said in, in that meme, for example. Then there's another one where it was like uh, Hey Hachi from Tekken, where he was like, if I find my son believes in the natural limit, I'm throwing him off. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not literally going to like like trash can deposit my son, but the idea is that like, I don't want my son to have those beliefs because I know the insecurities, the anxieties, the feelings of not feeling like you're good enough. I know all the feelings that associate with believing in the natural limit. And yeah. I don't want my son to feel that way, you know? I feel you, man. It's like we, we got to be hopeful and bring that back to everybody, you know, for the future generation of lifters who are going down the path of being black pilled because. I believe that's completely false and it just goes back to everything we talked about today and um it's crazy because like a few years ago i was talking about the natural limit you know i was a believer of it and now i'm, I'm totally convinced that it's not a real thing it really is a self-imposed state that we put ourselves in and logically like you know i i know i repeat myself a lot but small progression is still progression it's what it is. It's not a fucking limit. It's not, you know, it's something that you, you know, to your point, you're someone who believed in it at one point yourself. If you're someone that walks this natural path or even an unnatural path where you're taking steroids and you're just focused 
on progression. That's what separates someone that's worth listening to that's not worth listening to, regardless of their drug status. Is are they focused on progression? Are they focused on putting one foot in another, struggling, being the best that they can be? Even if you're someone that believes there is a limit at one point, if you walk that path, you're eventually going to be someone that says there is no limit. The universe is endless. It's, there's boundless potential. I'm only going to stop growing when I leave this earth. Yeah. Much. And if someone uh, does decide to stop after a certain point, at, at least like they gave it their all going into that and they cannot be regretful you know so like let's say between 25 and 40 years old someone takes their advanced numbers to super elite and they're freaking jacked out of the damn minds and they they have all the muscle and strength they'd ever want you know and they're like you know what i'm cool with this there's more important things to me right now i don't really want more in this like e even if that now becomes their limit it's still way better off than if they would have settled at like 32 years old, just to say. So like delude yourself, even if what we're saying is wrong. Let's say the natural limit theoretically does exist. Fuck it. Train like it doesn't because you're going to go higher than someone who has that restriction in his mind. You know, it's funny, bro. When we were 10 years old, you can go on uh, the bodybuilding.com forums, 315 bench press. That was like the pinnacle. <laughs> pinnacle. If you bench 315, you were like, you know, head honcho. What's 315? Yep. Not unimpressive, but it's certainly not a limit by any means. Everybody's saying four fives and you 315. Yeah, it's true. Bro, I, I thought 315 was going to be my limit when I, was, uh, when I started training. And then I got it. I was like, wait, what? I'm, I'm done making gains? Really? <laughs> so... Sometimes when you get to a number, you realize it's not as hard as you thought. Just to and say. There's always somewhere you can go. There's always somewhere you can go from there. That's right. There's always to be made. That's it, man. So um, I want to ask you, what's the personal record that you're most proud of in all your years of lifting? Mm, okay. Have to search through the data banks for that one just because I find, <laughs> I find interest in a lot of different lifts and then I become disinterested in a lot of different lifts and just cycle through them. But or if one lift is too much, what what's like three or five of them that you're really like happy to have hit? Some of my favorites, okay. So for the longest time, like for me, uh when I surpassed the two hundred pound overhead press, I felt like you know, you don't see anyone in the gym overhead press more than like a plate and, you know, a five on each side, really. So 185, yeah. like, OK, I'm super strong. And then finally surpassing 200 on the overhead press. The first time I did that, the first time I did three plates on a weighted pull up. My first one arm pull up. Um, when I did a one arm pull up, when I weighed 205 pounds. That's Without, good. That's what I was like, dude. Like this, this I'm really on to something, you know. Um, the first time my Larson press matched what my old bench press was. Ah. So I think Alex, you're gonna have a similar feeling when you hit that 405 Larson press. You're gonna go Bro. back to the press, and you're gonna be like, dude, like I could rep this for like two, two, three reps. Fuck. I believe you, man, because uh, it's a lot harder. Like when you've been benching for years and you know how to do it right, you, you feel the difference of a Larson press. And as you said, a 365 should equate to like a 405, right? Yeah. So I'm going to start with that. But once I go beyond like, heck, even getting 380 on that, I can only imagine the feeling. And what's interesting is a lot of the, the records you're most proud of, it's not even your best feats of strength. Talked about a three play pull up, but you've done four. Um, you mentioned matching your Larson with your, your bench, but not like your absolute strength, you know, your, your best out state. Uh, it's like you're enjoying the entire journey, not just the highest highs, but like everything that comes in between. And I think that's also proof that you love lifting, you're passionate about it, and you're here for all the PRs. I noticed how it's not just squat bench dead. There you go.
shit, you got to free your mind, man. And like I said, that was a very organic interaction that we just had. I legitimately just thought about to the times where I felt the best with my lifts. And it was in the course of my journey and not necessarily my best or where I'm at now. You know, enjoying that journey and becoming process oriented, dude. Like so many people are so results oriented to where even questions that they ask me, it's more about a result rather than how to make the process easier. You know, like how can I get a 315 bench? It's not, well, how can I, you know, break my plateau? That's journey related. 315 benches, you know, results oriented. So along this journey, how did you get to where you are now having this level of knowledge? I know there's, you know, it's years in the making here, but you really embody this lifestyle. And are there any specific books or podcasts or channels or influential people that have really like made you have those aha moments? Like what are some resources you could recommend to people right now who want to, you know, get to a similar stage? That's that's a great opportunity to uh, just uh, give thanks to a lot of different people, just because I do take influence from so many different sources of information, including yourself. Um, shit, man, it's just like any and everyone that I've encountered on YouTube fitness that had something to say that worked in some capacity for some reason in some scenario. That's something that I have up here and that everybody, you know, can internalize everything like that but i really have taken from chris jones physiques of greatness that's a real that's a real oh yeah go making videos but that's a real og uh the hodge twins have said things that like oh, okay i'm true I'm thinking, even <laughs> if it's the avoid snap city part like everybody yeah um everybody man like it, and it really just is learning these things and applying them to yourself seeing if who they work for, if they work for you or for somebody else, and just time, man. Like having fun with it too. Not yeah, being like you, process oriented, just seeing if it will work or not. And if it does work, how far can I push it? So you genuinely enjoy watching his videos and you mentioned the OGs. That means you've been watching them for all this time, since like 2011, 2013 till now. So it shows that you never stop learning because it's your duty to not only educate yourself, but give the best possible information to your clients and people who follow you. So you got to keep yourself in check year round. It's no, there's no living in the past. And there's no living in the past and there's no getting uh, too arrogant about where I'm at at the current, you know, in, in terms of my strength or, you know, how my channel is doing or anything like that or how much money I'm making. It's all about and it always will be about making sure I go through each of my videos. If someone has a question, answering it. It'll always be responding to as many DMs as I can. It'll always be refining my knowledge so that I can put out more free information so that people that don't have the means to pay me for something. Let me be honest with you. Most of the people that try to pay me for things, I turn them away just because there's a free resource that I want you to use. I took four hours to make it. Like, dude, use it. Yeah. Um, it's really just about raising the average level of confidence and the natural lifter, raising the average level of competence, their competency, and then their strength, dude. Like, I want all of us to be jacked and stacked and ripped. We all can be. And that's always what I'm going to be about. That's really awesome, man. And you're really big on integrity and the fact that you won't take someone's money, even though you can easily do that. Like, they hit you up because they trust you. They like what you're offering, and you're like, nah, man, I see that you don't need this right now. Go watch my free stuff. Take some time to digest this content, you know, and then maybe after you've seen some results with that, we can talk. So you, you, it shows that you're really here to help people, and you don't, you don't have this big ego attached to it. Absolutely, man, and that just comes with being someone that's real down to earth. Like, not to give too much of my backstory or anything like that, but I grew up real poor. I slept on a couch for most of my life. Rats, okay. Rats and shit in the house. Like I, I, I am so used to having so little in my formative years that I'm very happy now as an adult that no matter how much money I have, I'm happy with the effort for sleep. I can train and I can eat and watch anime. Like that's my, <laughs> yeah. you know, my, my bare minimum. And then sometimes I'll indulge in a video game, but, I don't need 
Anything yeah. else that comes as a result of what I do is just extra. That's cool, man. So, so would you consider yourself to be somewhat minimalist in life, or you just yeah. don't need a lot to be happy? Definitely, I don't. I, 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 I'm more happy by the, the stories people tell me about things that I've taught them about to, to, to tell me how I made them feel. I've had people approach me about just things that I won't repeat in confidence, but it feels good to know you're making a positive impact in people's lives. You know, that they trust you with certain situations and certain things that they they're so much better off now because of something that you or I showed them. That's yeah. way more valuable to me than like, OK, like uh, I have however many million subscribers. In yeah. Years, but that, what the fuck is that when I what die? Was exactly. You're here for genuine, real interactions that are going to make a difference. And, you, you know, that that person will forever be grateful to you. And, and you're and you're grateful for them as well. Like it, it, it goes both ways. And in general, you're very appreciative uh, for everything because you know what it's like to go through hard stuff. Yeah, man, absolutely. Yeah, all of us have different struggles, but we can all relate to that. That's why I try to be. I'm not like a nice person by any means, but I am. You're a good kind. person, is what I would I'm say. Good. Yeah, I'm very kind. I'm, I can be em empathetic. Yeah. That's what's up. So then, Paris, it's been a, a great pleasure chatting with you today. We covered so much regarding programming and just your general thoughts on how you think. I want to know, are there any final messages you would say to my audience as it pertains to either lifting or lifestyle? What, how would you like to end this off? I think we should all circle back on a, a place of giving back and appreciation and giving value. So. If you're someone that acquires certain positions to be able to do things like Alex is in a position to be able to have different content creators come on his platform to be able to not only to enrich his and enrich theirs, but enrich you guys experience as well. If you're someone that has an opportunity to do that at work, uh, whatever it is you do, do it. That's how you just elevate everyone else to be able to do those things as well. And everyone is so much happier for it. If you're someone that knows something in terms of training, whatever, share that information with other people so that everybody can be elevated. It's all about creating community. I think that's what's lost in this day and age. It's very self-centered. Just be someone that's willing to each one teach one, each one reach one. That's awesome, man. Give and you shall receive as well. So uh, if people want to reach you, where can they do that? Um, bald Omni Man. Uh, on YouTube and Instagram. Um, if they just want to reach out for coaching, whatever, I'm not necessarily going to you know, have you as a client because, like I said, I have a re free resource that you could use. But if you need reference to a free resource, you can reach me at the email that I leave in my YouTube descriptions. Or that's it, I think. That's the only couple I got. Instagram awesome. is the place I'm most responsive there. Okay, cool. So I'll be sure to provide all those links in the description box. And uh, that's it for today. Paris, thank you so much for being here today and sharing your knowledge and wisdom. I want to wish you continual success with your YouTube channel and coaching business. You have my support all the way, and I really like what you're doing. So keep it up, and uh, we'll chat up soon. Love is mutual, man. I appreciate it.